Good afternoon and welcome to the December 10th, um, 2019 Board of County Commissioners meeting. We're happy that you're here today and um, welcome to each and every one of you. Um, it is the last meeting of our year. And um, with that, we are um, fortunate to have um, Pastor Randolph from the Water and Stone Church here today come forward from St. Petersburg to lead us in our invocation. And for the Pledge of Allegiance, I'd like to ask Commissioner Gerard to um, lead us. Please stand. Hello. Let's enter in. <clears throat> Infinite Lord, we give thanks for this day and this life. Lord, we give thanks for this opportunity to serve. We dedicate and we consecrate ourselves and our services to the common good. May we be guided by kindness and mercy. May we be guided by love. Today, may our thoughts and words and actions Today, may our dreams combine to build a community and to make a world that works for everybody. And so it is. Amen. 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 Please stay standing. We have a um, very special presentation that Commissioner Justice is um, going to tell us about today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, about a month ago, several of us attended an event in St. Petersburg, and we were just all blown away by the national anthem singer. And so today, as part of our Pure Pinellas presentation, we'd like to welcome Miss Alyssa Conte for our national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fights or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets red the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave for the land of the free and the home of the brave? Thank you, Ms. Conte. We appreciate you being here today. And I so can you see why you said that. She, what an incredible voice and rendition. Thank you so much. And she's just getting over bronchitis, so even. Uh, <laughs> so appreciate you being here today. Thank you for. Okay. Um, next, we are very fortunate to have our own Pinellas County Choir here with us today, and they are going to also um, come forward and sing for us with their beautiful voices. <coughs> Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bell swing and jingle bell ring. Snowing and blowing your bushes of fun. Now the jingle hop has begun. Jingle bell, jingle bell, jingle bell rock. Jingle bell chime and jingle bell time. Dancing and prancing in jingle bell square. In the frosty air. What a bright time, it's a right time to rock the night away. Jingle bell time, it's a swell time to go riding in a one-horse sleigh. 
Giddy up, jingle horse, pick up your feet. Jingle around the clock. Mix and a mingle and a jingle and beat. That's the jingle bell rock. What a bright time, it's the right time to rock the night away. Jingle bell time, it's a swell time to go gliding in a one horse sleigh. Giddy up, jingle horse, pick up your feet. Jingle around the clock. A mix and a mingle and a jingle and beat. That's the jingle bell, that's the jingle bell, that's the jingle bell rock. Slavering, are you listening? In the lane, snow is glistening. A beautiful sight, we're happy tonight, walking in a winter wonderland. Gone away is a bluebird, here to stay is a new bird. He sings a love song as we go along, walking in a winter wonderland. In the meadow we can build a snowman, then pretend that he is Parson Brown. He'll say, are you merry? We'll say, no, man. But you can do the job when you're in town. Later on, we'll conspire as we dream by the fire to face unafraid the plans that we made walking in a winter wonderland. In the meadow we can build a snowman, then pretend that he is Parson Brown. He'll say, are you married? We'll say, no, man. But you can do the job when you're in town. When it snows, ain't it trilling? Though your nose gets a chilling, we're frolic and play the Eskimo way, walking in a winter wonderland. Walking in a winter wonderland. Walking in a winter wonderland. Thank you so much, and I want to um, <clears throat> recognize them individually. The choir started in 2014, and um, they've since that time brought joy and fellowship to our employees and our citizens. Um, they perform at county-sponsored events through the year, and their repertoire includes everything from cheerful and uplifting songs about their doing things at the county, all the way to inspirational performances for our veterans. The choir has performed at the annual Holiday Lights in the Garden, the Honor Flight Welcome Home Receptions for our Veterans at the airport, the Holiday Bike Drive, board meetings, and other venues. The members are, and if you could raise your hand, they're over here on the side, Tyler Cawthon, uh, Cheryl Culliver, uh, Rebecca Fiesbeck, Lisa Freeman, Valerie Fuzz, Jolanda Jordan, Maggie Miles, and Willie Roundtree. Again, thank you. This is the time that we do our proclama proclamations and awards. And our first item, um, I'd like to ask Daisy Rodriguez, who is the Director of Human Services, and the staff from the Human Services Department and representatives from the Department of Health to join me at the dais. Hi. How are you? Good. I'm going to have you introduce everybody. Oh, sure. OK. 
This is Daisy Rodriguez. Well, is it okay if I have them introduce themselves? Sure. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Karen Yacho, and I'm the healthcare administrator with Pinellas County Human Services. Hi, Elisa D. Gregorio. I'm the grants manager for Pinellas County Human Services. And hi, I'm Melissa Van Bruggen. I'm the clinical health services director with the Department of Health in Pinellas. Good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Black, and I'm the program manager for healthcare for the homeless. Hi, I'm Dr. Ravindra. I'm the Pinellas County medical director. Good afternoon. Um, I am Dr. Yuli Cho, the director of the health department. Thanks. Hi, Dr. Cho. The National Committee for Quality Assurance is a private nonprofit organization dedicated to improving health care quality. This patient centered medical home recognition standards emphasize the use of systematic, patient centered, coordinated care that supports access, communication, and patient involvement. The recognition programs are built on evidence-based, nationally recognized clinical standards of care. Being recognized as a patient-centered medical home demonstrates a team-based care approach, improved patient experiences, better management of chronic conditions, and improved patient-centered access. Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners Bayside MMU Clinic was recognized as a patient-centered medical home on October 25, 2019. I'm pleased to present this award to both the Human Services Department as well as the Depart Florida Department of Health in Pinellas County in recognition of their excellence to the citizens, excellent service to the citizens of Pinellas County. Okay. I just want to say that I, <laughs> excuse me, I, I'm very, very fortunate to work with such a great team, not only in our Human Services Department, as many of you know, but the collaboration and the partnership with the Department of Health is invaluable. Um, so thank you again, great work. And these were the folks that did all the work that led to this achievement and recognition. Uh, just to echo uh, Daisy's comments, uh, I think this is a really big testament to all the hard work and the hours that were put in by both staff, um, as well as that collaboration between the county as well as the health department. And ultimately what this recognition will enable us to do is really better serve and, uh, and, and ensure that access to care to a vulnerable population, ensuring that we have medical and dental, uh, mental health services, specialty care to this really much needed population. So thank you for that. Okay, we'll get a picture. I asked Daisy to stay here, and I actually think Laura just ought to come up too. So um, this weekend, I had the opportunity to catch up on some reading, and I'm going to ask that they um, display this on the monitors. We were recognized in the Florida trend um, for our um, the creation of the empowerment team, the um, Pinellas PCET. Um, which was a pilot program that you, you both started. And we are recognized as a notable effort because we've been a leader in using data-driven approaches to social services. Um, and this program is aimed at people with hardcore behavioral health problems. And so it really goes on and it mostly talks about our program. <laughs> and I am just so incredibly proud of that. And um, know you all put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into it, and your staff. Um, the other place was I get the AARP bulletin. I'm old <laughs> enough. <laughs> I confess. And so we were mentioned um, 
inside as a, one of their age-friendly initiatives for recreation. And um, so I first one, they, they had us listed as the very first um, county, and I thought, oh, they're going to tell that we're like the best age-friendly county that there is, but we got an honorable mention. So, <laughs> But I'd say that's pretty good, good enough for me. So... Um, so I just wanted to share that with you all and to congratulate um, let's see. Oop. I'm not finding it quickly. Oh here we are. So on you can see our fitness center, our fitness equipment that are in twenty different parks. And um, it's also featured on the front page of the AARP as well. So, want to say anything? <laughs> well, what a surprise. <laughs> um, that's great. Um, a lot of good stuff. Again, it, it, it takes a village, right? It takes a whole community, a lot of really dedicated people working really hard every day and recognizing some of the challenges that people have. And I think the success is that we recognize that we have to meet people where they are. So, thank you. Actually, I will say something. You know, we, we're doing a lot of work and continue to do a lot of work on behavioral health. And I actually want to thank you all uh, for always giving such support. Um, I, I can tell you I've been here for about five years now, and any time I've come up here and, and asked um, and provided data and trends and all of that, um, you all have just been wonderful to work with. So thank you all for what you do. And, you know, we are an AARP age-friendly community and one of the first counties in the United States. So, um, you know, thank you so much. Thank you. So, thank you. Okay, the next thing is our Employee Recognition Award, and it's to Larry um, Marcunas. And our employees work hard every day to make our community better. Um, in our ongoing video program, we recognize individuals who exemplify the excellence of our Pinellas County team. It's only through our employees and the excellent work that they do that we can fulfill our vision to be the standard for public service in America. Larry Marcunas keeps the Pinellas County facilities we work in safe and fully operational so that we can focus on serving the public. He's a longtime county employee who currently oversees maintenance of 33 county buildings in Mid and North County. His team in the Administrative Services Department expertly maintains everything from plumbing to fire alarms, and they're always ready to fix any issue that may come up. We're grateful for Larry's dedication to providing a safe and comfortable workplace at the county. Larry and um, our county administrator, Barry Burton, can you join me here at the podium? And you will notice that I am versus the county administrator and wearing neutral colors today. <laughs> that is honestly the loudest jacket I think I've ever seen. <laughs> Hi again. From parking lots to rooftops, fixing a door lock to operating a high-tech energy plant, it's Larry Marcunas's job to keep Pinellas County facilities running so we can serve the public. All of our buildings, we take care of the HVAC, the plumbing, the cleaning, janitorial services, and the card access for any of the access and the secure areas. As a facilities operations manager, Larry oversees maintenance for 33 county buildings from Clearwater to Eastlake. That means keeping up with the latest technology at the county's chiller plant, while also providing extra TLC to aging or historic structures. Every little thing that we do, people have eyes on. There's more work than one person can handle, and that's where the broad expertise of Larry's team comes into play. Plumbing, doors, air conditioning, security, fire alarms. And if the job gets too big, Larry coordinates with the best contractors to get the work done right. For Larry, 
Maintaining good communication with others is key to his goal of maintaining Colony facilities. I think the favorite thing about my job is the interaction with all the people that I work with on a daily basis. It's whether it's over the phone, through email, just communicating with other, with other people. Larry's top priority is keeping residents and fellow employees safe. His team responds to urgent issues like a water leak or broken AC unit while working to fix potential hazards. We're looking for anything that might be a safety or risk factor. It could be a crack in the sidewalk. It could be a loose threshold, a loose handrail. It could be a door that snags on someone's shirt. In other words, his mission is to provide a safe, clean, comfortable environment for all of our employees that work for Pinellas County. A lifelong county employee, one of the things Larry enjoys most is seeing how his work makes it easier for residents to do business with the county. I am Larry Marcunas and I am Pinellas County. Thank you. So often we don't think of all of the folks behind the scenes that are doing things for us every single day that make such a substantial difference. And so we're very grateful to you and um, thank, you so thank you for serving so many years. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Um, just want to say happy holidays to everybody. And uh, I was not on fleek in that video, but that's okay. A little joke there. But uh, just I'd like to thank everybody who made the video, Josh, Tony and all my mentors and my management, Andrew Pupke, Keith Royster, Carlos Negron, and uh, helped me travel through this path I've been going on for 31 years. That's all about the people that I've worked with over the years. I've known so many people. I just saw Gay Lancaster over there. That I, I remember when she was in the admin. And uh, it's just, you know, it's, 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 it's all about the, the people that we've worked with over the years. So uh, this opportunity was it's a it's a lifetime of it's one of the best job it's the best job I've ever had. I'm glad to I'm to, to work for Pinellas County. So th thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and and th you know again, uh, my, my thanks to you and and to your entire team because you know I think what, what re the vi video really showed is how complex that job is. It's it's you know yes it's fiction a threshold but it's very sophisticated HVAC systems and water systems and and you know health and safety type stuff. So you know it 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 involves real skill sets that you obviously you've come back and you refresh your training and stuff and that's that's that you have to keep up on that year to year and everything. So. We really, really appreciate all the dedication, hard work, because you know our employees want to be able to, and our public want to come to a safe environment to work. Without you doing what you do, they couldn't do that. So again, thank you and congratulations. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, so now we have a little bit of a surprise one. Um, we'd like to ask Jake Stowers to come up. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna. Hi. <laughs> Yes, you have been here before, but <laughs> so to, we are, um, today is Jake Sowers' day. 
in recognition <laughs> and in honor of Jake Stowers, Pinellas County Assistant County Administrator, who started his career with Pinellas County in October 1974. And whereas Jake continued his remarkable <laughs> career until April 2006 and gladly came back when called and asked to serve Pinellas County again in April of 2014 through this date of December 2019. And, and this is so true, whereas throughout Jake's career, he has had a passion and a love for this county second to none. And whereas, <laughs> and whereas Jake's vision and his pursuit enabled Pinellas County to establish the Environmental Lands Acquisition Program, and he led the establishment of the Pinellas County Environmental Fund, which is a partnership between Pinellas County and the National Fish and Wildlife to fund environmental projects. And Jake was instrumental in the acquisitions of the Brooker Creek Preserve property, the Whedon Island property, as well as the education centers, along with many other environmental um, and park lands. And during Jake's career, <clears throat> he has woven an environmental awareness into our land use planning and development rec regulations. So today, we honor Jake for his commitment and his service and his dedication to Pinellas County for a total of 37 years. The thing that, you know, Jake's family has been here for a long, long time, and he was actually born here, and he has some good tales to tell about Pinellas County before some of the areas got developed. But truly, beyond this, you really have to know how much land has been preserved in Pinellas County because of Jake's efforts. I know we have over 8,800 acres and we, in Brooker Creek alone, and that all, you know, was going to be developed into homes and retail and other uses. Um, but today it's a beautifully pristine environment for hiking and enjoying nature. And it's the same thing down in Whedon Island and all the other environmental lands that we bought, the McMullen property near Wall Springs, you know, and I've been here through quite a bit of the acquisitions and it's just been remarkable. So with that, what would you like to say? Put you on the spot. That would be nice. Thanks. <laughs> uh, I do love Pinellas County. Having been born here and, and watch it through my many years, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, we used to be able to have towns, <laughs> but that stopped. Now it's pretty urban, but it's still a place that you can enjoy the outdoors, and I would suggest everybody, Tom's just arrived, and I keep telling him, go, go look at some of these places. Perry, go look at these, because Florida's a fabulous place, and Pinellas County is an unbelievable place. And I just, I'm, I'm glad and hopeful that people will use it for years and years to come. And I do thank you. I, it's uh, why I came back, it's a great place to work. And anyone that gets the opportunity, and Larry, where'd Larry go? He, he was just here, and that's, uh, that, it is a great place. And a great place to be, a great place to live, work, and play. That's a, First thing, isn't it? No. <laughs> no, that's a that's a Pinellas thing. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, well, Jake, I, I especially want to thank you for you know staying on because I come out on a year ago and you, you said you know I'll stay to help you know I'll stay as long as you want me to stay right and and I know you wanted to eventually retire again. I I, I told people I think that Monday morning I'm going to come in and he's still going to be at his desk. But you know, I, but that that just goes to kind of his commitment and love for the county. Um, so he, he has stayed on. He's given us some, some of the knowledge that you've gained over the many years and kind of the love and passion about some of the programs that you've started. That'll carry on forever, you know. And so thank you for, for transitioning and providing that knowledge for us to work from. Um, much, much appreciated. Um, I think I should have went first because, you know, I get to give Jake his five-year award, okay? <laughs> but, uh, 
we have good records here. You know, it's just it was a it was a second run at, at, at retirement. But we'll we'll add this to the proclamation and his pen. But for all the 37 years of service, I just want to thank you so much and the best with you and your family in your retirement. We're going to enjoy. Thank you. Well, Joe and family, come on up. We want you to be in the pictures. Did you know they were here? <laughs> Surprise. <laughs> well, I didn't accept that one. I don't think I have any other surprises for today. Okay, we now have citizens to be heard. And um, Lenore Faulkner would like to speak on education excellence. Lenore Faulkner. Okay. Um, David Bad Ballard Geddes Jr. on Largo Reclaimed Water. Hi, good afternoon, Commissioners. Uh, David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia oh. Avenue in Palm Harbor. The Tampa Bay Times newspaper featured an article about reclaimed water in Largo, citing the city of Largo had to shut down its use of reclaimed water because it's not safe. The city stating that the reclaimed water system of such failed to meet the criteria for disinfection and for safety reasons, the residents must immediately stop using the partially treated wastewater as the system will be shut down for an undefined duration of time. As I've stated before, one time, one mistake is all it takes to contaminate the entire town. One time for the disinfection criteria to be substandard and diseases resulting from airborne contaminants from our sprinkler system that we inhale and or contaminated water in general would devastate the civilian population. In light of this newspaper article on the city of Largo and the example given last October at the Southern Comfort Mobile Home Park having fecal bacteria related with its water supply, an accidental cholera or Ebola outbreak at this point would be viewed not as an accident, but seen as a subversive, subversive act of warfare using water as its election of choice. Terrorism conducted by factions of such working in and of the government itself, wasting, contaminating, laying bare the water supply is the 14th Amendment objective of legislation intent on destroying the lives of our people as written in the Declaration of Independence. Directly injecting reclaimed water into our aquifer 
taking our fecal nitrates and injecting our wastewater directly into our aquifer with the SHARP and the TAP program, contaminating the, is, is to contaminate the water supply from which we get our drinking water. And the results of injecting reclaimed water into our aquifer can and will be catastrophic. I think at this point, we need to deploy a, a dry toilet program. Um, I don't think using our water for our toiletries is, is a sound practice anymore based on, on the uh, usages uh, that, that that's our government, legislatively speaking, and is doing with the uh, wastewater and gray water um, as a result. Thank you. Okay, Lenore Faulkner. <clears throat> I apologize. Good afternoon, Commissioner Seal and your distinguished commission. Thank you for your service. I'm Lenore Faulkner, uh, Florida's professional educator since uh, 1967. I am me born in, at the United States Naval Academy January 3rd, 1946, same year as President Trump, Bush, and Clinton. In 1963, I graduated from Pensacola Catholic High. Uh, the principal has been there since 1988, over 30 years. Our motto was Pro Deo et Patria, for God and our country. We are to serve God and the world with selfless love. I was super sick teaching at Pinellas Park Middle for 10 years. I introduced over 300 eighth graders to chemistry each year. My principal asked me to be head of the eighth grade teachers because I did not send anyone to the office. I taught uh, eighth grade chemistry using art, and uh, you will hear STEAM. My students' chemistry magazines were on the internet in 1998. I had cancer in seven of my lymph nodes, taught during my chemotherapy, didn't miss a day. In January 1999, I left and participated in a clinical trial out of Memphis. My white blood cells were killed in March of 99 in Clearwater while you were attending the final four in St. Pete. I thought it was my final four. Uh, it was a black cloud over Morton Plant. Many patients died. My white blood cells arrived four days. Uh, thank you, Jesus. My oncologist retired, his wife retired. The oncology nurse, my stem cell nurse, moved to Pennsylvania. I've been home alone for 20 years. I also go to the every um, every holiday. I go to um, the Tampa VA. My son's been sick there for 20 years. I go five days a week. And um, in 2003, my doctor wrote a letter for me to retire immediately. 30 educators walked for me in a cancer walk after I left. After I left, 30 teachers put in for transfers in the entire science department. 38 teachers were at lunch last week. Pinellas Park Middle was scheduled to open a new school in 2007. I promised to attend and speak at board meetings until Pinellas Park is 100% complete. In 2005, I met with your Director of Economic Development and told him my project. His wife started to work at Pinellas Park Middle in an after-school program. He kept me abreast of what was going on. I spoke at the last school board meeting. Dr. Grego invited me to check on um, the progress of Pinellas Park Middle. I told him I would just sit in the back and speak until it was 100% complete. God bless you. And I just want to say um, bless Commissioner Maroney's wife and son Michael and Brian. You were great people. He was the one that asked me to come here, and I love him dearly. Thank you. I have no other citizens who wish to be heard. Okay, we'll move on to the consent agenda, which is item six Somebody through twenty nine. Does Somebody anyone in the back that raised their hand? Oh, okay. Well, come on up, and then we'll ask you to fill out a card afterwards, please. Is it on an agenda? I think they're on. Is it on an agenda item? Probably. Is it on an agenda item? Yes, but I wanted to speak in the beginning because I can't stay to be all the way down. Is that okay? Is it? 
It's, it's yes, but she needs to. She can't stay until the agenda items. Okay. Are. All right. Thank you. But please, did, have you signed a card already? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Pat Fling. I'm a member of FAST. There are over 50 of us here today. Some are in the overflow room. Please reject all affordable housing guidelines being brought to you today. They do not protect the affordable housing money for families who make less than $50,000. We need to ensure that residents of this county are not threatened by constant evictions and homelessness as a result of spending as much as 80 to 90% of their monthly income on rent. If you do the math, that amount of monthly rent set against a flat lined income is simply unsustainable. Individuals and families engage in acts of desperation by paying portions of rent rather than buying food or paying utility bills or by paying utilities rather than rent while trying to keep a roof over, over their heads. We favor um, using the um, affordable housing money for people earning 80% of the average median income, not 120%, which is about $96,000 and above. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Um, thank you very much for your help. Okay, we are moving on to consent agenda Thank item Karen. six. <clears throat> Mr. Perkins? Lee Hall Perkins. Hall Perkins. You can't stay name. until the agenda item either? Correct. Okay. Yeah. So, yes, my name is uh, Lee Hall Perkins. I'm the senior pastor at Mount Zion United Methodist Church in Clearwater. And I'm here also calling the commissioners to reject the affordable housing guidelines being brought to you today by the JRC. Um, they do not protect uh, the affordable housing money for families who make less than $50,000. And as you all know, um, that there's a great need for families who uh, are making uh, that type of money for affordable housing. And I know this personally because I have a member in my congregation currently who a single mom with a 10 year old child who's been on the waiting list for a housing voucher for two years and finally got it and still hasn't been able to find affordable housing in our county uh, and so that is why I, I do not support the recommendations of the GRC today thank you okay. <clears throat> um, consent agenda items 6 through 29 anything need to be pulled move, move approval, approval. Oh, second Moved by Commissioner Eggers and a second by Commissioner Gerard. <coughs> Nothing on the board yet. It's not coming up. It's not Thanks. showing on our it's not showing on our screen. <laughs> Us to go to a verbal vote. No. Okay, we'll just go ahead and do a verbal vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, very good. Um, we will move on to agenda item 30. Agenda item 30 is a resolution and lease agreement with Gulf Coast Legal Services for office space at the 501 First Avenue building in St. Pete. Move approval. Second. Motion by Com um, Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, passes unanimously. Agenda item 31. <clears throat> it's a resolution and lease agreement with the state of Florida Department of Corrections for space at 14250 49th Street. Uh, this is uh, for the Department of Corrections to, office, uh, to occupy office space located at the County Justice Center for training and administrative duties. Move approval. approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welsh, second by Commissioner Long. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Agenda Wait. item 32. Agenda item 32 is a rep, um, resolution um, designating certain Pinellas County code enforcement personnel 
uh, supporting the construction licensing board, uh, providing for public record exemptions for current and former code enforcement officers. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by Commissioner Gerard. Question. Question. Okay. On how how far back do we go for past enforcement officers on the on the construction licensing board? I don't know the answer to that. Is it just an option? Do you know how far back we go with past um, employees? How far back on what? Well, how far back on what? It's offering a public records exemption for current and former officers. I was just curious how former does that exemption apply for? I, I just spoke with uh, Don Cole, and I, I do believe that it goes back because of the existence of the special act and the creation of the PCCLB by the legislature. I think it would go back to the beginning. So it's under the state's exemption of their officers under their agency? That's yes. <laughs> uh, actually, there is under the law when someone, the statutes that allow for counties to enforce their ordinances provide that you have to designate certain employees as authorized to enforce those ordinances. So fundamentally what this resolution is doing is authorizing certain employees and gays organization, the department, to enforce those ordinances. It's the same with your code enforcement department, building department, any department. Separate and independent from that is a public records exemption that attaches to the individual as a current or former code enforcement officer. So it would apply to anybody who is a former for former code enforcement officer. Okay. Is that what the answer you were looking for? That was the information I wanted. Thank you. All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? That uh, passes unanimously, agenda item 33, and we have um, quite a few speakers. citizens that wish to be heard. Agenda item 33 is a resolution adopting the Penny 4 Affordable Housing and Economic Development Program Guidelines and a sunset of the Joint Review Committee. Um, as you're aware, the Penny 4 Interlocal Agreement um, from 2017 stipulates that 8.3% of the net Penny 4 proceeds will fund econ economic development capital projects and housing over a 10-year period. Uh, you established a 12-member joint review committee. Uh, they've met between March and October of this year, led by county staff and a consultant to develop the guidelines, and these are guidelines, um, and unanimously approved uh, them to forward to you on October 25th. These guidelines will be used by county staff and program partners to review and recommend projects for funding for the Penny for Housing and Economic Development Capital Projects. Um, as you're also aware, you adopted a resolution designating that 4.15% uh, of those would be spent on affordable housing programs. That is, de that is clearly designated and it targets the uh, uh, lowest income, goes up to 80%, and also if there's a market study that, that says that there's a gap in need up to 120 percent, but that is not the, tar the primary target. All right, that's what I wanted you to mention before we had the speakers come up. I'm, I'm actually asking Della to pull up the resolution. I'm trying to get to it. I didn't know that they were they were coming today because I, I want to specifically address <coughs> that because I've actually met with FAST. I've met with groups. These, these are guidelines, and we're going to be looking and we're going to be reviewing these year by year as programs and projects come in. Part of that is we're going to need to work with um, um, uh, folks to build affordable housing units. That's going to be a process. Um, you've, you, you recently adopted a modified um, comprehensive plan that significantly increases density along these primary corridors. The reason for that is to be able to make it more affordable to build and have a better chance of actually delivering units. When we're looking at taking projects and using SHIP funds and state funds and trying to cobble together the projects, we're, 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 move, we're putting out a couple hundred units a year, and, and we need several thousand units a year. We need to put this program on steroids. And so our, our whole goal through this program, and these are guidelines, but our whole goal is to, is to make sure that we can um, advance those. And it's going to be a combination of our capital funds. It's going to be a combination of working with private developers, um, looking at joint use projects, and looking at various income levels. There are different types of projects, and each one will be needed. And it's going to be a work in progress. And so each year, we've committed not only to working with FAST and other entities. Um, we actually, um, on January, 
I want to say, I don't know, December 18th, whenever, um, yes. when is it? December 18th? So December 18th, we're bringing together um, with the Healthy St. Pete uh, Foundation, um, all of our municipal partners and talking about how to work together because many of our um, affordable housing projects will be done within municipalities. Um, so we're talking about how we can work together with our partners. We're going to roll that into a summit in the spring to bring our elected officials and everybody together, partner agencies, and talk about how to advance our mutual housing goals. This is setting the foundation of just guidelines that we're going to have to have, we're going to then have to have criteria to apply. They're going to be developing the criteria over the next several months and be rolling that out of the summit in the spring. Um, but that need, still needs to come back to you. How do you have an application process? How do you review it? How do you uh, differentiate between different income level type projects? And that's going to be a work in progress that we're going to need to work together on. Um, and the reality is they're all needed. But the, the lack, and you've seen the numbers from our recent workshop, the, the numbers of the lack of affordable housing is staggering and something that we have to get very, very serious on. You've, you've committed 4.15%. 4 you've committed $80 million on this over the next 10-year period. So we're trying to establish some guidelines but allow for flexibility to really try to move um, some of these projects. Okay, well, I was hoping <clears throat> that helps. Um, and, and then the background um, presentation, it again does emphasize the resolution 19-6 passed by the County Commission on February 26, 2019 to 40% of the assisted units will benefit households making 60% of the average median income or less or 100% of assisted units will benefit households making 80% of the AMI or less, um, et cetera. But it does, um, it does continue to give the commitment by the county commission towards this end. With that, um, I, I ask respectfully that if you still wish to speak about on this, please come forward. But if this information is beneficial to you, then um, we do have a fairly long agenda today, so that would be helpful. Um, <clears throat> Georgia Gaston. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. <laughs> According to the Schimberg Center, 83,000 families in our county pay more than half of their income toward rent. 71,000 of these families make 80% or less than the area medium income, which means that they make about $50,000 a year. This means that 86% of families who pay more than half their income toward rent in Pinellas County make less than $50,000 a year. <coughs> it makes sense then that the penny housing money should go toward families making $50,000 a year less, $50,000 or less a year, since they are 86% of those in need. We are calling on the county commissioners today to send a clear message to staff who wrote these guidelines, staff who are mostly from economic development departments that they should stick to the writing guidelines of the 4.15% of funds for economic development and that these guidelines are not acceptable for the affordable housing money. Thank you. Judy Charmatz. Um, <clears throat> Bill Cooley. Ellen Seto. Oh, I declined. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for standing. Um, Ka um, Kayleen Kirschensteiner. Kayleen? Kayleen, excuse me. Bob Meehan. Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, I'm Bob Meehan, 
and I appear before you as a member of FAST, Faith in Action for Strength Together. We have concerns regarding the Penny for Affordable Housing and Economic Development Program guidelines to be presented after our speak, speaking. Uh, we are prepared to work with you and the administration uh, to make modifications that are mutually acceptable. I will be addressing one of our concerns. <clears throat> The guidelines state that there is a nexus between affordable housing and economic development and seems to encourage characterizing affordable housing as workforce housing in order to obtain flexibility in the way affordable housing funds can be spent and to support <coughs> economic development. When we requested splitting the funds for affordable housing and economic development, we did so to assure a clear distinction between affordable and workforce housing. They are not the same thing. Many of the families in greatest need for affordable housing are not and will probably never be in the workforce. They include the elderly, disabled, infirm, medically ill, and special needs persons. The statistics tell us that the greatest need for affordable housing in Pinellas County is families and individuals with incomes at 80% of the area median income and below. Indeed, some 71,000 families in that range are one paycheck away from homelessness. We well understand the benefits of recharacterizing affordable housing funds as workforce housing. We know that it would permit greater flexibility in the way the funds are spent, especially allowing them to be used for construction. Still, we believe that the distinction between affordable and workforce housing must be maintained for the 4.15% of penny funds devoted to affordable housing. Conflating affordable and workforce housing only muddies the water and takes the focus off of supporting the most vulnerable populations in our county. We are well aware that the statute limits poverty or penny funds for affordable housing to land assembly. With buildable land in the county becoming rapidly more valuable and affordable housing stocks rapidly shrinking, we need to exercise the wisdom and consider the value of acquiring land now, even if it must be held for future development as other funds become available for development. Let us follow the guidance of Resolution 19-6. We are specifically concerned that the guidelines section labeled Tier 1 Prioritization prioritizes mixed-use affordable housing projects supportive of economic development over projects that provide assisted units consistent with Resolution 19-6. These two priorities need to be reversed. It must be recognized that Pinellas County faces an affordable housing crisis in the hopefully rare event that a conflict between the addressing the crisis and supporting economic development arises, addressing the crisis must be the highest priority. Could you please, your three minutes are up, sir. Could One you please sentence. conclude? Thank you. We support the development of affordable housing, or of workforce housing, using the 4.15% of money, or penny funds, dedicated to economic development. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. Um, <clears throat> I see Reverend Kathleen Walter wanted to be the first speaker. I apologize. When you have a lot of cards, it's... Oh, I will do my best to stick to the time. Good afternoon, Chairwoman Seal, Commissioners, staff, County Administrator, no. and County Attorney. Thank you. My name is Reverend Kathleen Walter. I am the Rector of St. John's Episcopal Church in Clearwater, and I am also a board member of FAST. We are here today to oppose the affordable housing guidelines being proposed in the Penny Four Affordable Housing and Economic Development Program guidelines being presented to you today. 
we ask that if you approve these guidelines, you first modify pages 6 to 10 of this document. As we are concerned with some of the language regarding the spending of the affordable housing money. There is a long history in this community of money which was set aside for the poor and the needy being allocated instead for those of more upper class. If that happens again, many of the voters who approve the present penny for Pinellas will consider this a betrayal and you will therefore have a difficult time getting future tax increases approved. These guidelines seem to be written in such a way to specifically allow for the possibility that the 4.15% of the affordable housing funds for the needy be used for more upper income people or for infrastructure or economic development projects. A reminder that last year 2,500 people came together at Tropicana Field to applaud the passage of the resolution and that the county commissioners, you made a specific commitment to really address those most in need, which we believe studies identify as the 80% or below. The county administrator, Mr. Burton, and thank you again for saying that today, promised us in the fall that no recommendations would be approved that in any way undercut that resolution. We do believe that some of this language allows for undercutting of that resolution. Many of the goals written in the affordable housing guidelines could be moved to the economic development section. We have no problem with the spending of 4.15% on economic development or infrastructure or mixed use complexes, but these should not be the guidelines for the affordable housing money. We also would like to ask that as you have in the past, that you consider to continue using Catherine Driver and the Housing Finance Authority as the body to guide you in the spending of this money. So today we ask you to reject the guidelines or to eliminate or modify the section on affordable housing. Otherwise, we believe you are laying the foundation to undercut the great work you have already done that we clearly support and want to work together with you. So thank you very much. Well, you timed that for me. Donna Davis. I think that you have answered what I wanted to hear, and I think my colleagues have stressed our point, and I would just be bending you repeating some similar things. <laughs> thank you for the work you're doing, and we'll be here working with you and with you. Thank you, Donna. Um, Ralph Madison. <clears throat> Hello. Thank you for allowing me to speak this afternoon. It's been a real pleasure to be here. I've been to another couple of other council meetings, and uh, I'm a relative newcomer to the county. I've only been here 26 years, so I'm not as well versed in the county as you are, and I'm really impressed with the work that you all are doing. And I do want to urge you to vote against the resolution that's presented because <clears throat> of the fact that there is some definite unclarity about <coughs> some, of, some of the matters that we've already expressed concern for. So the, the issue or the question is, who speaks for the poor? Um, all three of the major uh, religions in the United States, uh, Islam, Ju Judaism, and Christianity, all have scriptures that sell, tell us that God speaks for the poor. Sometimes his voice gets muffled, sounded out, not heard. So I hope that you will, like the great prophet Elijah, listen to that still small voice of God speaking for the poor. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Susan Littell. Susan? <clears throat> um, I'm trying to read this card. I apologize. Kalterusi? C A L E R U C C? 
and from St. Pete. Waving their time. They're waving. Okay, thank you. Um, Wanda McCothin? Wanda? Uh, Marilyn Ward. <coughs> Marilyn Ward. Kathy Philippe Philippe Kelly. Kelly. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good to see you again. Thank you. Good to see you too. Thank you for being here, Kathy. Um, <clears throat> Kyrie Edwards. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and Estelle. Um, Bonham, Bonham, Bonhamont? Beaumont. Beaumont. My comments coincide with those of Reverend Kathleen. Okay, thank you. That's all the cards that I have, but I do want to recognize all of you while standing. Is, um, thank you for being here. Did you want to speak? <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you all. Um, we will proceed with the presentation that yep. we have and um, try to provide you with a little bit more um, peace with what's been drafted because I believe what's been drafted is what you were looking for. Um, so. Mm. Good afternoon. Uh, Mike Bidell. I'm the Economic Development Director for Pinellas County and uh, also was the chair of the Joint Review Committee that uh, brought these guidelines to you today. We do have a PowerPoint presentation to, to share with you today. If um, staff could bring that up for us. They don't have it. They don't have it. Okay. Let's see. We're having some great technical issues today. So. <laughs> <laughs> so put it on it's the on overhead. The, it's on Granicus on the. It's on Granicus. Can you pull it up from Granicus? It's a. It's an attachment to Granicus. You can do that, Raheem. If they can't pull it up, just use your <clears throat> use your iPad um, on the dais. Paper thing there. Mike. Okay. Terrific. Oh, there we go. Just scroll. Do we have one? Oh, yeah, I've got, I've got I think it on we're my having screen. technical issues today. Got oh, you got it. <laughs> we got it. I've got it on my screen. Is it on yours? Yes. There we go. There we go. Right. <laughs> ah, perfect. All right. The uh, Joint Review Committee was originally instituted by the interlocal agreement that was formed in 2018 that set all the guidelines for the distribution of funds from Penny 4 amongst municipalities. And the 12 members were selected in a manner similar to the Ford Pinellas process, where we have uh, the city of St. Petersburg had two members, the county had three, um, the larger cities each had a, a single member, and then the smaller communities had representatives um, to be able to ensure that everyone on the committee um, and every municipality had input into the process. All of the members were in planning, economic development, or housing staff capacities within those municipalities. The guidelines were um, established at that time to to truly to set aside that 8.3% of the total amount of the penny for economic development and capital projects and housing. And the committee was, uh, we had a collaborative labs meeting back in uh, 
uh, early 2019 and uh, all the municipalities attended and we set up a process for selecting those members and our first uh, monthly meeting was in March have been meeting monthly ever since and resulted in the guidelines being approved by the Joint Review Committee in October 25th of 2019. Um, an important uh, distinction here is that the Joint Review Committee will uh, sunset after the adoption of these guidelines. The uh, purpose of the Joint Review Committee was to establish those guidelines. And the fact uh, is going forward when we're working projects with municipalities, we can't operate in the sunshine and that Joint Review Committee tends to be the people who will be doing these joint municipal projects. So it makes sense to continue to work together our municipal partners, but not in that formal capacity. These are the members of the team, and I have uh, many of them in the audience today. And I think if you're on the Joint Review Committee, would you mind standing now and be recognized? We have uh, Denise Sanderson with Clearwater, Bob Ironsmith with Dunedin. Uh, we did have uh, yep, Carol. Carol, <laughs> Carol Strickland was our vice chair from Largo. And um, I believe that's here. That's all that we're here today. Thank you. Um, and we did feel as if FAST were another member of the committee. They did attend uh, every one of our meetings and participated in the public comments. So we're thankful for their input throughout that process as well, particularly uh, Reverend Catherine Lean, because she was there, I think, at every single meeting. And, and we appreciate that input. <laughs> As the, the original structure does set aside 4.15% into two separate pockets, 4.15% for the affordable housing program, 4.15% for the economic development capital projects program. Now, the, the land acquisition for affordable housing is the same process that would occur under Penny 3. That's where we have to buy and hold land. Um, the government has to own that or some quasi-government agency has to own the land in perpetuity. What is different about the language in this current uh, Penny 4 um, ballot is that we can now use uh, money from the penny to do vertical construction. Now, the problem with the only limitation on that is state statutes require that that money be used for workforce nexus housing between 80 and 120 percent of AMI. But that is only for the vertical construction component of it. The uh, land acquisition for affordable housing is for all income levels. Um, so that, that has not changed from Penny 3. To give you a few more details on the economic development portion of the program, we hired a consultant. HDR um, was a prime consultant. SB Friedman was their sub that looked at the economic data. They went back and looked at all of our studies that were previously done on both housing and economic development, going back to Pinellas by Design that identified that severe shortage of available land for office industrial uses. Uh, we looked at the updates to Pinellas by Design to that target employment study that I, again went into great detail on the acreage available for office industrial use. Looked at the competitiveness study that, that we did in economic development to look at how we stack up against uh, the surrounding counties in competing for projects and uh, competing for office and industrial space. They also conducted stakeholder interviews primarily with developers and, um, and realtors within the area to get a good gauge on what is the actual supply and demand of office and industrial space. And they also looked at a, you know, and prepared a formal market analysis of what is feasible, what is in demand, what are the, uh, the recommendations. And then finally, they looked at building topology. So they looked at what is in demand currently in the realms of flex space, industrial space, and suburban and urban office space. So that shows us what the, the, the product is that is being requested by our, our target industry companies. And then they also looked at development pro forma. So they took a look at land prices, prevailing rents, costs of construction, and uh, took a look at, at how those would stack out and, uh, and if, we, if we were actually putting together a deal today. <coughs> The study looked at, identified some barriers and issues. Uh, obviously, the one we've been dealing with forever is that industrial land is limited and is under constant threat of conversion to other uses, primarily from uh, the um, retail and multifamily uh, sectors. And we, you have put into place some barriers to that, some strong barriers, and we appreciate that. In the comprehensive plan, 
It takes, uh, you've, you've expressed a strong interest in retaining our industrial property and put some high standards in converting that to other uses. So that stays in place. But more land is needed for, for targeted job growth and is currently vacant, and, that it, and we need to find ways to convert some of that older obsolete space into productive space that is in demand by today's current um, employers. We're also looking at that obsolete building stock for office space as well because the, the footprints are too small, the parking is not sufficient, and, and other uh, considerations there in the office stock. And then finally, we're looking at the fact that new development may not be financially feasible given the current prices of land in some areas of the county and the current market conditions. So this, the next we looked at the uh, challenges on the industrial side, and this chart just, I won't go into it in great detail, but the columns in white describe our current average supply, the types of space we have available. The gray describes what is in, currently in demand by our uh, target industry companies. You'll see that in general, the demand is for larger space, higher ceilings, more parking uh, than we have available in the, in the current stock. And then the same holds true of our, uh, of our office space. They, again, they need more parking, they need uh, a larger floor plates, and they definitely need newer space. Um, we don't, don't have a lot of Class A office space available anywhere in the county that is in a sizable chunk. We've got it in three and 4,000 square foot pieces, but not in the 35,000, 25,000 square foot floor plates that are in demand for major employers. This chart kind of shows you how we're going to structure the guidelines moving forward. There are three distinct pots of money, or actually three distinct programs that we will utilize as part of uh, distributing the funds from the Penny Four, focusing only on the ED capital projects. The first and the most important is the new construction, expansion, and conversion of, of office space. This is for vertical construction. This is private or public partners coming to us saying we are ready to build office or industrial space. And, and then we will use the, uh, the proceeds of Penny Four to help make those deals happen. But the important critical thing here is we will never make a bad deal good. We'll never be on the front end of an arrangement. We are there to fulfill a proven financial gap between the ability to build the space that is needed and the realities of the marketplace. And that will have to be proved by the private sector or the public sector um, uh, party, or party that comes to us for funding. And uh, we will use uh, outside consultants to verify that and to, to just ensure that this will only be used to fill that gap. The Site Readiness Program is a program looking at publicly held land that can be prepared for office and industrial use. So this may be property that has some, uh, some pollution on the, on the property. It may be something where we've got older obsolete buildings that could be torn down. It uh, it's could be things like Airco, our former golf course out by the, uh, the airport, and, uh, and similar properties owned by the municipalities. And what would be done there is the ability to bring in the infrastructure to fill the uh, uh, stormwater requirements uh, to make those properties ready for uh, the construction of uh, vertical office or industrial space. And then uh, finally, the public infrastructure is an opportunity to take these funds and use them to link multiple private properties that have potential for office industrial use. But this infrastructure, public infrastructure, like septic tank conversion programs, like a uh, access road that connects multiple properties, like regional stormwater systems, those kinds of infrastructure, though public, help contribute to the ability to uh, build on those private pieces of property. And all of it ties back to ultimately building office and industrial space in those suitable topologies that would be beneficial to our target industry employers. Now, we can use this for any number of, of uh, reasons, the, the parking, public infrastructure, uh, development costs, demolition, site prep, land acquisition. We cannot use these funds for operating or maintenance expenses or for direct cash incentives to a private party. 
So the, the guidelines for our priorities are pretty simple on the economic development side. The first and foremost, we want to create new office and industrial space. So the highest priority will go to people who are ready to build and ready to put that product available to our target industries. We also focus on locations within the county that are highly in demand by those types of users. So this will be our targeted employment centers which is the overlay on the comprehensive plan map that is most of the Gateway area, a lot of the Bryan Dairy area, significant part of the Oldsmar industrial area, and then scattered sites throughout the county. So there are target employment centers throughout the county from Tarpon Springs down to South St. Pete. The urban activity centers are in downtown Clearwater, downtown St. Pete, and the pr primary uh, premium and secondary corridors are those transit corridors, transportation corridors you find on the Ford Pinellas plan that are what well, we've already tried to increase density upon those corridors and to help link jobs to affordable housing to the training programs that are necessary to bring people up um, in, in their income levels and, uh, and improve their career ladder as they move forward with their, with their lives. The projects that will generate the higher returns on investment are the ones we're going to focus on when we compare project to project. We'll look at ROI. We'll look at it in terms of fiscal ROI to the county. How are we getting tax dollars in return for the investment we're spending? We'll look at the economic impact, the jobs and the wages and the output that is created by those jobs and, um, and take a look at the entire picture when we compare projects to each other. The site readiness program, again, one of the key things is this is publicly led. This, the land has to be publicly owned initially. <coughs> Once the site readiness um, program has been completed, um, it could be sold off to private interests, but initially when we do the preparations and the investment, it will be publicly held. Same is true of uh, public infrastructure. It'll always be public infrastructure. There's potential that it could be sold off at a later date, say a regional stormwater system of a private entity want to take that on as part of a larger industrial area where they were master developer, we could certainly do that. But initially, as this program unfolds, it will be publicly held properties. The other important thing uh, is that this program will not be designed to replace the current CIP budgets of the municipalities or the county. We already have a road project in the budget. This money is not going to be used to supplant that. This is for new opportunities to create new office and industrial space. So that is the uh, portion on the economic development, and I want to see if there's any questions now before I turn it over to Evan for the housing side. Commissioner? Yeah, um, thank you, Mike. Um, timing on, on some of this is everything, you know. So um, yeah. as land becomes available or, a, you know, uh, are we, are, is any of the money going to be available for assembly of land um, so that, Oh, I mean, we're like banking land? Yes. Um, okay. Yeah, the site readiness program would be where that would be placed. So we would have the ability to assemble smaller parcels into a larger publicly held property where we can then market the land and hopefully make the uh, infrastructure investments too to clean up the site and to make it more suitable for a vertical for a, construction. For a larger... But it could be buy and hold. And as you say, the business cycle will kind of depend on that. Right now, we may have some actual projects ready to build. If the economy turns around within that 10-year period, it may be a perfect time to buy and hold land um, when the prices drop and when there isn't demand for current or vertical construction. So the program is flexible to take advantage of that. Okay. Thank you. Any further questions? <clears throat> Great. Thank you, Thank Mike. You. Thank you very much, and I'm going to assume this is how I forward the slides. Is that correct? Yes, it is. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Um, my name is Evan Johnson. I'm with the Planning Department, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the affordable housing guidelines. Um, as the members of FAST were talking uh, earlier, um, we know we have a significant challenge um, related to affordable housing. This table is an overall summary of 143,000 households uh, making under 120% of the uh, area median income and that they are cost burdened. So that means paying more than 30% of their income for housing. So we can, you can split these numbers in, in many different ways, and they are correct. You know, whether you look at 80% or 60%, there are significant need throughout the county. Um, housing program background has already been mentioned a little bit. Uh, resolution 19-6 has kind of served as our guidance uh, as to your intent. 
Um, and those numbers, uh, as we talked about before, 40% of the units under 60% uh, AMI, 100% uh, of the units under 80% AMI, or some other percentage based on market studies or documented need. So that's what we've kind of used and we've prioritized that, as I'll mention a little later, in our guidelines uh, for the affordable housing money. Uh, this program does expand upon the land acquisition uh, process that you all created um, under uh, Penny 3. Um, in that it allows for land acquisition, um, much like it's being done now, as well as for some capital expenditures. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. It is focused on a variety of income levels, um, up to, and we, for the purposes of the guidelines, we've capped it at 120% max of AMI. Um, but ultimately, I think as we're working through our specific application process and how we do prioritization for money, will also be tied to income levels and closer to that intent of 19-6. So that's always been our intent. Um, but for the guidelines, these are guidance to get us moving forward and working with uh, the committee to get us here. So the housing program framework, uh, this is, um, the, there are two main uh, eligible uses of funding, the land acquisition. That is a process that we are already using under Penny 3. Uh, you, we must hold the land in perpetuity, whether us or some other designated uh, entity. Um, and then there's also the capital project piece. Now, because of the way the statute allows for capital expenditures related to housing, it has to have that nexus with economic development. And what that typically means and what we've been working with legal and others to continue to define is whether that be workforce housing, uh, we believe uh, that that may expand larger than 80%, that may be 60% to 120 uh, AMI. But in order for us to maximize the flexibility of the program, uh, which is what our goal was from the beginning, we wanted to make sure to include an option as we move forward because this is a 10-year program. We don't know uh, all the types of projects and issues that are going to come up. So we wanted to maximize that, that flexibility and allow for it to happen. Now, we are coming back to you all with the specifics of our application process, and some of that may include further prioritization within each one of these tiers. So if as we have that discussion, you want us to kind of push something up or down, depending on that, that's absolutely what we've, we've, we want to do throughout this process moving forward. I just yes, ask one little question mm -hmm. um, before, I forget who said it, that the capital projects had to be between 80 and 120%, yes. but you said they could that, be less than 80? So mm -hmm. the, the, the statute itself does you. not clearly define that it has to be 80 to 120. It does clearly define that there has to be a nexus to economic development, and we as a policy have capped all of this program at 120% AMI. Now, the land acquisition program has to be under 120. Right. Uh, we went ahead and adopted the same cap for the uh, any of the economic development capital project money. But it could be 60. That Yes, yes, and, and, and we will be working uh, to, to kind of... Well, and that's the, I just wanted to yes, clarify That's that. also both pots of money because you got you got more flexibility right, right. when you're right. talking about workforce and the economic no, development. No, but I thought maybe that was restricted to 80 it, it to 120. It is not formally restricted, no. No, okay, it is great. not. Uh, so project guidelines, I'm going to walk through quickly the, the different tiers and be glad to answer any questions about them. There are three tiers. Now, it is important. I did hear earlier one of the comments. We haven't actually prioritized under the tiers yet. Um, so if you look at tier one, because one bullet is ahead of another, that doesn't mean it's our uh, a priority. Like this isn't tier one, one, you know? So what we'll be doing is kind of further building that out over the next month or two as we kind of put the, the criteria and the scoring together. Um, so our tier one criteria, um, mixed income uh, housing, affordable housing with approved entitlements in uh, key geographic locations. So unfortunately, because of the slide, I didn't get to put that entire bullet on the slide. Um, but I think it's important that what we were really trying to get at there is if we're, uh, if we have a project that meets um, our geographic goals, if it provides affordable housing, and it's ready to go from an approved entitlement standpoint, and these folks have their money and they've got a solid application ready to go, we want, we want to get units built. So we wanted to say, uh, you know, that's a special project. It, you know, if history says anything, it's not going to be a very frequent project, but we wanted to make sure that if that comes up, a mixed income project with approved entitlements and financing located in the premium, primary, and secondary corridors of the forward Pinellas land use strategy map. It's a very specific, uh, you know, uh, type of project, and I would say it's, you know, it'll be rare, but we want to make sure to support it. So, yes, ma'am. So that's basically a project 
that has say applied to the state for the tax credits and they got it okay. they're missing right, one right. little piece and they want to come to so us so we would want to prioritize that yes, because, because it's, it's going to be sensitive it, thing i okay. am not a housing gotcha. specialist but i work with them in, in community development i will tell you as <laughs> Catherine driver will speak to you these deals are very complicated and complex right. so they take a lot of time okay thanks. Uh, rental housing this was a preference of the committee um, to allow um, yes we don't want to pre, uh, prohibit home ownership programs but we thought that as far as bang for your buck ability to deliver new units to the community, rental housing should be a priority. Um, mixed use economic development uh, nexus, that speaks to mixed use affordable housing projects supportive of economic development. Again, this is a project that I hope to see, um, but the idea would be that it would be affordable housing in, um, in concert with maybe uh, allowable office space or uh, some other type of employment space, not a retail development, but the idea of you could have some office integrated with affordable housing in a development. So that was, we saw that as an important, uh, yes, yes, sir. Commissioner. Thank you. So when we're talking about the tier one specifically yes. in this, this, and those, that kind of unique project, mm -hmm. are we talking about the flexibility of the 4.15 over here or the 4.15 over here? So the, the assumption is that the housing program, as I'm speaking of it, is 4.15 of this is what I'm talking about for the affordable housing program. So it's all included under that 4.15. So it's only the land assembly that we're talking about in these, it, in this particular. So, yeah, so, so it's the 4.15 was committed to affordable housing and our program that we have developed includes both the land assembly approach, if you will, and a uh, capital projects approach. Those are the two things that are the two possibilities that you can do, but it's all under the affordable housing umbrella. Yes, but even to that point, you could mm -hmm. you could have uh, if you're going to an office um, mixed use development, you could have affordable housing money and economic development funds. Right. Well, that's what we want. Project. That's, that's what, what we want to see. Is right. we, we don't absolutely. want. Oh, absolutely. We don't want the, and I don't want to use this word, but commingling of it to at the detriment of the guarantee of the 4.15 that so, we've committed to on the land assembly. Take some for me. So, cut. Right. You could you could get some of your um, infrastructure, which mm -hmm. you have much more flexibility on your economic development size, right. that would cause the affordable housing project to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and so then use your land assembly funds for the affordable housing side, but you're mixing it with a larger economic development project. So the 4.15, whether it's being used for the land assembly, the ownership of the property, or whether it's being used for a capital improvement related to housing, uh, it, it can only be spent on affordable units, assisted units. So what we've done and what we've heard is that we wanted to continue the, the land acquisition program and we want to make sure that we continue to work with Catherine. I just met with her on Friday as we're talking through the application project uh, process. We want to make sure to continue that, but um, we also recognize that there's a challenge in getting money to help spend for other improvements to help affordable housing projects. And the only way to do that was to allow for some economic development nexus money, as we've described, to be used. So ultimately, there's 4.15 being set aside for affordable housing, and all the dollars that are being spent on that 4.15 will be associated with a assisted unit, an assisted affordable unit whether it's because we funded some infrastructure on the site or whether it's because if we've... If I could try to... Yes, absolutely. She's going to provide some clarity <laughs> doing a great in job. English. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel when we have these discussions that because of the statutory scheme, we can become overly s siloed in the right. way the statute reads. So the statute in regard to what it considers an allowable use for affordable housing is extremely limited. It's limited by um, the income guidelines, which are pretty high, so mm -hmm. not really limiting from the way we look at them. The big limitation, obviously, as you all know, is it's limited to land acquisition. That's all you can do with the funds as provided under the statute. Under the statutory authorization specifically related to affordable housing. When you all adopted this ordinance prior to it being placed on the ballot and the voters weighing in on it, you, we, we talked about, we, you made some legislative findings through the ordinance adoption process that said, yes, we recognize a nexus between economic development and affordable housing. 
The reason why we did that is because the economic development provisions in the statute are very broad and allow a wide range of uses. In fact, the only <coughs> limitation on those funds are self-imposed. When you all adopted the ordinance, you said we are not going to use these for economic developer for cash incentives, and you're not going to use them for operations and some of the things that some of the limitations that Mike spoke about previously. Um, so again, the only limitations on the economic development funds were self-imposed. We were trying to break down those statutory silos in the adoption of the guidelines to say we're not going to say it's got to be land assembly if it's affordable housing, but it can be all these other things if it's economic development. We're more trying to focus on 4.15% of the funds are going to go to affordable housing, and it doesn't matter which portion of the statute we're looking at because when we mixed the two, we gave ourselves the ability through your legislative determination to use it for your traditional land purchase, which is what we've had a partnership with the HFA for during Penny 3, but also give yourself the ability because of that nexus to sort of grab from what we're thinking of as the economic development side, but would allow you to put in maybe infrastructure to support the affordable housing development. Maybe do some capital. You know, I think that that's, you know, again, goes towards the flexibility. But what I want to say is we don't want to be overly focused on whether it's the affordable housing bucket or the economic mm -hmm. development bucket under the statutory uses. You know, forget about what's authorized by the statute. Let's focus on what your ordinance authorized, which is a mix and a mm -hmm. nexus. So if I could just break it oh. down, what I want to say is 4.145 is still going to go to affordable housing. We just tried to give ourselves more flexibility in how that 4.15% can be and will be spent. And, and I would take it one step further, that you can use economic development as leverage dollars to cause affordable housing units to be built by, by, by making them part of a project. Mm -hmm. So if, for instance, would be, and that's to provide even more clarity, is <clears throat> you could use the economic development monies to build mm -hmm. a road that leads to an affordable housing project. You could build stormwater mm -hmm. to support the, that development. You could, um, exactly. you know, there's other items that would in mm -hmm. make that affordable housing project happen that by using economic development monies makes it work. That's that's correct. Bottom that's exactly, line. That's exactly right. So, I mean, this is actually a bonus or making this all work. So would that allow allow for um, site remediation or site prep type? Yes. Yep. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So we could take, we could come in, we could put in an office building, you do your regional detention, you put in your road, and in the back you're putting in an affordable housing project. In and of itself, that affordable housing project would not have happened financially, but because of these other things, you were able to make it happen. Well, and I know that, <clears throat> Some of that site remediation and prep work is something that we haven't been able to do in the past projects. Correct. 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 And that is due primarily, at least the way we're looking at now, your Penny 3 did not include the economic development right. allocation. Okay. Right. All right. And it's required to be in the ballot language is why it wasn't included in Penny 3. Okay. Okay. Commissioner? Okay. I'm trying to follow all of this. Um, and I just want to, because what you said and then what Barry said were just maybe the same, but I just want to make so. sure that they weren't a little different. Um, because it sounded like you were saying that you could use it for parking in the driveway into the project. Barry was saying if it was if it had an, if an economic development nexus, nexus, like an office building in the back or an office building associated with it. In and of <coughs> itself, an affordable housing project does not qualify for any economic development money okay. unless it has a nexus for nexus. that. And the nexus and this mixed use is probably what has a lot of people scratching their heads or a little mm -hmm. concerned. Either way, whether you're trying to protect the economic money or you're trying to protect the, the, the affordable housing money. So I just, the word nexus is a little concerning and a little... Mm -hmm. And know. I think that's the reason for the concerns raised by Bass, not right. to speak for them. The, how many projects have we seen where it said 20% of the units are going to be 50% or less, 20% of the units are going to be, you know, up to 80%, 20% of the units and then the rest market rate. You know, Part of these is going to be looking at the projects and having criteria to evaluate them. Right. Um, and that's also going to change. You're looking at units that will be built for to generate rental 
Um, there's a lack of rental and affordable rental. Um, there's regular units. So there's there's a wide mix of different types of projects. So providing the, the guidelines of flexibility, the real thing will is be how do we evaluate those and what we deliver on. Okay, can I follow up with can I follow up, Madam Chair, mm -hmm. on that? So let's take the commercial piece out of it a minute. And so you just talked about a residential piece that had mixed mm -hmm. AMI numbers in there. So if you're a certain number of them would be under 50 percent, certain number would be under 80. The land that we provide for those units, for all of those units, could be used to build a project that has projects over 120 percent. No. The land we purchase would have to be for for affordable housing units, and maybe you'll have to speak to that. Because well, you just mentioned because the mixed because you've got a, if you had a market rate piece to that, would that be allowed? I don't know the answer to that. My understanding, and I don't know if I have somebody from community development to as well to assist, but my understanding is it that as far as the, the the land itself, if we're purchasing it, if it has. It would be a, well, actually, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the no, the way we structured it is, again, it goes back to that financial gap. So the value of the land that, we're, that we own, that, that the government owns, that's part of making that affordable housing deal happen, cannot exceed the value that we receive from those affordable units, right. the, the units that actually qualify under the plan. So what we've got is a multi-layered financing scheme, and that value of the land is a sliver of the total cost of the project. But we will ensure that that value of the land never exceeds the, no, the, the value of those affordable units. So that's how so that's how we get that nexus. So that's okay. quality. And, and if I can add one more thing, I, just to kind of go back to our, our buckets and the way we've looked at it, the way we structured the ordinance allows us to tap into the economic development bucket and yes. use it for affordable housing. So that's that's why we, that's why we structured and it. And that would be another sliver on top yeah. of the yeah. land sliver. I understand. <laughs> so but, we could. But I think one know, of the concerns it. that I'm hearing is that they don't want the dilution of the uses yes. of the funds for affordable housing. Exactly. Right. And so what you're saying is is that the percentage of that development that's over the 120 percent AMI. Will not be funded. Will, will not be funded. funded. The the, the, per, the percentage right. of the of, of units. And the percentage of the land cost would be one and the same. I know. Yeah, the we're trying to keep yeah. it exactly. Okay. Yeah, the non-assisted units would be paid for with private funds. The second yes. question I've heard mm -hmm. raised is obviously the 120 percent number and the 80 yes. percent. That's a different number, a different issue. But I just wanted to make sure that we're preserving yeah. those units. And um, technically, another advantage to the, the the housing side of things, we when we developed the ballot language, we looked at nexus studies that had been done proving that even a pure housing development on its own without any office or industrial space on it can still identify a nexus with economic development and with jobs. If we can prove that this is an area in which those entry-level jobs for manufacturing or office space are needed, and we can show that nexus that this we're in close proximity to those jobs, that's sufficient. For economic development. For economic right. development funds, yeah. yes. Right. Not for the how you know how right. the right. land assembly funds, but for the economic well, development. And, funds. and I kind of intuitively agree with that, but I heard somebody make a comment that well, any of the folks that are under fifty percent of AMI are not going to be working. And that's well, and that 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 yeah. caused me was caused well, me. Well, you know. fifty thousand though. Uh, the current I think the twenty seventeen AMI, if I remember, is fifty one five twelve. Right. So right. it's right near fifty thousand for a hundred percent. Of AMI, right. Right. so a lot of people yeah. who are at fifty thousand or less are going to be covered by this program, and will and we'll in, in, indeed be entering the workforce. Exactly, uh -huh. and, yes. and I think oh, that's a, right. I think that's an important, and I, I, that's why I was having an issue with that other comment. Um, and I so somebody had made the comment that there was a group that's not likely to work, and I agree with that yes. statement. That's a totally separate. But there are a lot of folks that are be under that fifty thousand dollars that are hoping to elevate. They have access to, uh -huh. to, to jobs. They have that's the whole plan that we're talking about under the you know under our MPO BOCC PSTA discussions is trying to have those those places to live that get them to work easier and, and access jobs. So. Okay, exactly. I just want to make sure exactly. that I understood that. Okay. I know. I do. I know. Very good. I, 
Now, does everybody understand that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> still, I still think we still have the other discussion. But. I think what you know I've said before is the good news is that we will be able to use that 4.15 percent, the almost 80 million dollars, to buy land for affordable housing. We can use economic development money to augment that and to you know build roads and, like I said, other <coughs> infrastructure that can make some of these projects happen. Um, I, and that being said, I want to provide some clarity. Okay. <clears throat> As we've talked about mixed-use development, when I first joined the county, our standard for affordable housing was 20% affordable housing, 80% at market. <laughs> We are now about 50-50. Right. We've changed that policy. We're doing projects with mostly 50-50. And all I do not want to have happen is to create the old public housing of years ago. So we need to be very cognizant and recognize that it will be good for us if we can work on you know, the tie between economic development and the affordable housing because we want to have a mix so that we have the best living environment for our citizens. I'm sure. Commissioner Welch. Yes, sir. Are you still going, Evan? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm here <laughs> to answer any questions okay. you have. <laughs> we, we do have a few more slides, but yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can wait for two slides if you want to finish. Sure, okay. it's up to you. Madam Chair. Sure. Okay, so uh, the last item I wanted to mention, we've already talked about it, uh, on our Tier 1, uh, resolution 19-6, we are using that as if you're meeting those uh, three criteria that you identified in the resolution, obviously we would consider that a top tier project as well. Uh, tier 2 looks at preserving affordable housing. Uh, if you, uh, we oftentimes get projects where uh, developers will buy something and need money for renovation or to preserve an affordable housing if they're willing to enter into an agreement uh, to keep those units affordable. Um, we, like, we see that as a positive project. Uh, projects with more than 30% affordable units, uh, guaranteed affordability greater than 20 years. It's important to note that if you use the land assembly piece of the funding, and it's a land assembly project under the statutes that uh, uh, county attorney mentioned, um, that's affordable in perpetuity. And if you use uh, economic development dollars to support affordable housing and, not, and we don't own the land, um, there's not a specific cap. So we want to say at least 20 years guaranteed if you're going to get any money from the county if you use that money. So in perpetuity, if it's a land assembly project, if you use this economic do development dollar, it's got to be at least 20 years. So that would be a priority there. Uh, located in the uh, center's corridors um, and CRAs, uh, we've identified as well in the land use strategy map. Uh, the level of government support, local government support, as uh, uh, Administrator Burton mentioned, a lot of these are going to happen in cities. And so local government, whether it be financial, whether it be regulatory relief, whether it be in-kind services, um, we want to make sure that we're, we're taking that into account and prioritizing those communities that are stepping up and, and helping. Um, and outside of your coastal high hazard area and your flood floodplains. And then finally, tier three of the last of the uh, priorities uh, tiers, a project located in areas with demonstrated shortages of affordable housing. The intent of this was if a developer comes to us with a market study that we've approved the process and shows specifically that there's a need in a certain area, um, we could uh, use that as part of our ranking process. Again, this is tier three, so it's a lower level priority, but that's, that was important to us as well. Uh, lowest county financial contribution per unit helps the dollars go further over time. Um, and then projects owned by any uh, CHDOs, community housing development organizations, um, which would hold in the, the partners that we work with here. And then finally, our schedule for this project is we're here today on December 10th. Uh, we are currently working diligently on pulling together application package. Uh, we're hoping in the next couple of months to come back uh, first to our community partners and talk to them about uh, the, uh, the former JRC and others. Talk to them about what we uh, come up with, and then we want to take their input, come back to you as well, make a presentation and talk about the detail. Um, of where we've gone with criteria We'd and so We'd be happy forth. to meet with FAST or any other. Oh, absolutely, groups. absolutely. Um, and then as uh, Administrator Burton mentioned, ongoing uh, annual BCC review, we, uh, we've been talking about ways in which we can show how the money was spent, where it was spent, number of units, types of projects, as well as challenges, challenges that we've run into. I mean, this is a 10-year program. We're not sure. We're going to do our best to get the word out. We're going to do our best to bring uh, uh, potential applicants in, but ultimately, things may need to be tweaked over the long term, or we want to come back to you and have that conversation every year. 
uh, to make sure that we're spending the money uh, in the most effective way possible. So with that, I think that was my last question. Commissioner Welch. Great job. Just a couple of um, questions and an observation. Uh, first, I want to thank FAST for your uh, steadfast advocacy over um, almost um, 20 years now. <laughs> Is it 20? Something like that. Yeah. 16 years. It feels like 20. Um, and I was looking at one of Bruce Bussey's um, great spreadsheets uh -oh. um, going back to 2006, hmm. Catherine, and it's showing over 4,000 units of affordable rental that we put on the ground here in Pinellas County. And that's not even counting the ownership. And so I just want to address a couple of issues. Um, it seemed like when we were starting that we were almost talking past each other. But I, I think this is really a time to celebrate because we have achieved what I think this community was looking for. And I go back to what the chairman uh, addressed on page seven. You know, and I'm reading this, it says 100% of the assisted units will be 80% AMI. 100%, am I reading that right? Mm -hmm. And out of that 100, 40% will go to 60%. That's the target. And that sounds like exactly what uh, we've been working with cool. FAST on. Moreover, if you go back and look at how we spent that money since 2006, mm -hmm. we spent most of the money for 80% AMI and less. And so I think there's a track record from this commission in doing what we said we do. And so I just, uh, again, as I always say, ask you to stay involved in the process because as I understand this the project still has to come back to this commission, mm -hmm. right? That's correct. So this will still be the final uh, determiner of if a project is funded. But, you know, the $21 million we funded for the Housing Trust Fund over the years, the $18 million for the Land Trust, we have used that the right way. And it has impacted the very people that, that uh, we're all concerned about. Um, affordability, you know, I want my daughters and hopefully granddaughters to be able to live in this county. And it is a real crisis. I think this is only really the beginning of what we need to do mm -hmm. when you talk about establishing <coughs> a base of affordable housing. And I think the other thing we need to do, frankly, as a community, is get past the stigma of affordable versus workforce as a word. Uh, I've told my commission colleagues I had the opportunity to bring up former Mayor of Sarasota and show her some of the housing projects that we've done, urban flats uh, down in St. Pete, Brooker Creek, Booker Creek, uh, you'd never know that was affordable housing because it's managed well, it's housing any of us would want to live in. And so we've got to get past that NIMBY stigma of affordable housing. Um, and the last thing, I, I kind of chuckle when Barry was talking, and not because of your coat, because I love that coat. It is awesome. <laughs> but, um, you said about 80 million, and these folks are specific. Mm -hmm. So it's 82 and a half million, <laughs> which equates to, equates to that 4.15%. And we have put that in a resolution. Yep. I mean, I think this is about as solid as you can get. I know FAST wants certainty. And as I've said many times, the only certainty is making sure that you stay involved and you elect folks who are going to support this going forward. But I, I don't want to hold this up. I'm very supportive of where we are now. We've made a lot of progress. And going forward, uh, I'm, I'm looking to what else we can do to kind of expand this and sustain it. So, a uh, great job, and again, fast. Thank you all for being involved. Thank you, Madam Chair. Question, Commissioner. Yeah, I'm, I'm. I'm continuing to want to be educated and learn more on, on the fly sometimes. So, um, one of the one of the things that again one of the speakers said was really taking care of those in need, mm -hmm. uh, and certainly I think most of us <coughs> support that and agree with that. And to me, that need level evolves in sure. time. So how do we monitor? How do we ensure that, like, somebody um, is, is making 40000 and uh -huh. we get them into a house that gets them access to a job, and they're, and they're making 80000 uh -huh. uh, They get married to somebody who's making 50000 and they're still living in an affordable unit. How do we, in other words, they have affordable out of it. I mean, they, they don't qualify as they initially did. How do we monitor that process as folks go through, trying to make sure that we keep the, the, the folks in need in the housing that we have money for? Right. So I can speak to the portion related to 
Uh, what we do on an annual basis as far as monitoring to make sure that the units that have been agreed to set aside stay set aside as affordable because I know that was one of the conversation points we've had which is uh, for some programs we hire third-party vendors who go out and do basically inspections make sure that the number of units that were committed to in the, in the agreements are remain affordable to those income levels and then in some instances in some programs uh, my understanding is that community development staff itself goes out and does inspections to do the same thing uh, to make sure that the units that have been agreed to or funded are still maintained or still housing uh, uh, folks who need them uh, and so forth. I cannot speak to the specifics of a individual lease agreement or something like that. Um, I don't know if someone is available to do that here. I don't know if well, I was just going to ask. Yeah, I would certainly like for somebody yeah, yeah. to look into that. Oh, absolutely. And I know there are, I've heard, I've heard, there, that's who, this is what I was looking for. I know Sherry can speak to it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Sherry Harris, Community Development. So I just wanted to understand your question was how do we monitor? The individual income levels for homeowners that have qualified for affordable housing under the parameters, it, it, even if the parameters that the FAST folks are asking for, which is 80% of AMI and under, mm -hmm. they've qualified for it on day one, mm -hmm. and they've got their unit, and they're living their life, and they are now... They've got married, they have a partner, they have a job that now is paying them twice what they got originally, and they're still living there. How do we check for that occasion, or do we? I mean, as long as they continue to live there, they're allowed to live there, or do they have to requalify under each new lease agreement? So with the assisted units that we provide the funding for, um, there are a certain number of units that do have to stay income qualified. What we typically have done with a lot of our developments in the past is that they're called what we call floating units. So we have some that meet a higher income. So it's not designating the individual, but it's a unit, and that unit can float within the development because the goal is we want them to move up um, and be successful, um, and we don't want to have to displace them as well. So we typically don't have 100% assisted units in a development so that we can allow for that to happen. But the, if that does happen, they can stay there. They just have to pay 30% of their income. And there is language that's in our agreements that we have put okay. forth. Does that answer your question? Kind of, yeah. And do they have to do an annual income verification as well? Yes, as Evan said, we, we usually use third party with the larger developments. We do have some that we do in-house. Some of the smaller developments that are meeting our special needs, um, we're actually doing some of those in-house. Okay, thank you. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Evan and Mike. I appreciate it. Um, at this point, I would entertain a motion to pass the Approval. resolution. Second. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. And I'm sorry, who did the... Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, <coughs> I'm sorry, just had one more question. Sure. I'm sorry, before we vote, and I'm, I'm, I mean, it comes to Mike more than anything. Um, on, on page 17, you mentioned CRAs as a potential location, yes. and that... I think of the different CRAs that we have. Obviously, the, some, some of the CRAs uh, per square foot cost of land have gone through the roof. So we're not talking about all CRAs. We're just talking about the ones that meet certain standards. Yeah, like we have some CRAs that really could need, need that boost, need that housing, need yeah. that. Okay. Well, and the, and the CRA applies only to the housing side of, for, yeah. for a prioritization. And that's because many of our CRAs are not suitable for target industry employment. But yes, you're right. The CRA is just a criteria that goes into the process of vetting a project as being one project being a better return on investment than another. So that will be part of that application process, how we weight that, how we compare that to non-CRA areas, or compare that from one CRA to another will be part of that process we develop through the applications. You know, because you're right, not our CRAs are created equal. Yeah, certainly um, not now. Yes. Yeah, within the same city, it can be quite different. Right. Okay. Yes. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Didn't get any specifics. <laughs> what city are we talking about? I didn't get any specifics. Just so I have a motion by Commissioner Welch and a second by Commissioner Long. <laughs> and are the voting cards working at this point? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, there we go. Okay.
passes unanimously. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> um, moving on to agenda item 34. Agenda item 34 is behavioral health consulting agreement with KPMG uh, for an innovative des uh, project design to evaluate our adult behavioral health system. Oh, do you have proof? Second. Yeah. Uh, motion by Commissioner Peters and second by Commissioner Welch. Sorry, that's good. Me too. Okay, that's unanimous as well. Agenda item 35. Agenda item 35 is the sub-recipient funding agreement with Pinellas County Schools for the STOP School Violence Prevention and Mental Health Training Program. We, we previously addressed this as a continuation. This is a new program, but it does not have a match. Not have a match. No. So who's supporting the other half? No, it, there's no match requirement. Okay, Sorry. I'd move to approve that. Second. Move approval. Second. Okay, a motion by Commissioner Peters, and I think the second was from Commissioner Gerard. Okay, thank you. And again, Daisy, you and your staff are just generating grants and good projects, and we really are appreciative. Um, okay, we're ready to vote. That's unanimous as well. <clears throat> okay, agenda item 36. This is amendment number four to the purchase authorization um, for the Acela Civic Platform, expanding this out to the construction and licensing board. Approval. approval. Second. Okay, Commissioner Long, and then who is the second? <coughs> Commissioner Sorry. Peters. Okay. Yeah, we'll split it. And yay, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and. Just want to see Gay smile over there. <laughs> Gay's going to be jumping up and down for joy. She was. Yeah. <laughs> Still looks like it's going to take a year to implement. <laughs> but, um, okay, who are we missing? Mm -hmm. Commissioner Welch? All right, that's unanimous. Go forth and excel us. <laughs> excel. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, agenda item 37. This is an agreement with Pinellas County Sheriff's Office for law enforcement services provided by, for the environmental, uh, by the environmental lands um, unit deputies. Move approval. Second. second. A motion by Commissioner Peter, second by Commissioner Long. Okay, that's unanimous as well. Okay, agenda item 38. <laughs> This is an intergovernmental agreement between Pinellas County and the city of Dunedin to establish the Dunedin uh, planning area. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. <clears throat> okay. Okay, that's unanimous. Okay, <clears throat> agenda item 39. <laughs> agenda item 39 is the authority to advertise a public hearing to be held on January 14, 2020, regarding a single family private doc permit application um, at 224 Driftwood Lane in Unincorporated Largo. The, rec the staff recommendation is a denial of the request for a public hearing. The reason for that is um, two neighbors have a sense appealed the permit. They, at the, as part of the dock permit process, um, the neighbor signed a um, the permit, which would grant the uh, neighbor the ability to um, build the dock. There was only a, a 30 day a 30 day period of which they could revoke their um, approval. They are within that time period, but they signed the original uh, the original doc. They have since now requested that a public hearing be held on uh, revoking their um, their approval. What you'll see from the staff report, and I've had a, a few conversations back and forth, and I know staff and our county attorney's office um, also spoke with them, um, those objecting, is that they didn't understand the size and scale of the dock that was being um, requested of them to be built by the neighbor. Um, it is on the on the plans. Uh, it's clearly on the plans, the dimensions. 
it's hard to see necessarily on a 32, a 32 foot two or a 52 foot whatever it was to one inch scale um, but the dimensions are on there so now and they're going to be speaking but they're so the staff recommendation is that it was approved the neighbors went forward they built the dock the these two neighbors are requesting that we have a um a uh, a public hearing um at which they would object to the approval and we and the request is to revoke that approval and i think um raheem is here to uh, is there anything any else that you all questions? um obviously the um the dock owner as well as the neighbors wanting the hearing are here so is there any more information that you all want to see before we hear from them okay then um we will um start with mr patel the owner of the dock oh mrs patel Um, my name is Rudy Patel. I'm part of. I'm one of the owners for 224 Driftwood Lane. We hired a dock company to construct the dock. We, from what our understanding was, was to get waivers if it goes outside certain amount of dimensions. We were advised to do that. I did. The dimensions were on, on the sketch, on the drawing, you know, and they signed it. I didn't pressure them to sign it. They signed it. We handed it in, and we got a the docking um, construction company got a permit. So um, as far as I know that um, the staff has given like information that I like look through, but they've made like the points that um, that I would have made. So I don't know how much more I can um, add, add to it though at this point. Thank you. So um, both Mr. and Mrs. Doreen are here. Um, Mr. Doreen, do you want to start first? And both of you will have three minutes. My name is Fred Doreen, and I reside at 226 Driftwood Lane. We are appealing this permit for three primary reasons. We were not informed of all the variances. Excuse me, could you, could you speak up just a little bit? I'm sure. sorry. <coughs> we, we were not to... informed of all the variances. The only variance figure we were given was grossly understated. And we have an event of fraud, possibly two events of fraud. This is a graphic that shows the true variance. The old dock, the new dock. Now, the new dock dimensions, that's what we did see on the form on Ava brought over. That shows the change. And then there's a change from the code, the code variance. I had asked for a copy of this to be sent to all of you. When our neighbor came over, this is the form she gave us. And asked us to sign. We asked, what are the variances that we're approving? She said she didn't know. She left and came back and said it's four feet, four feet closer to your property. On this form, it states right here, the undersigned does not object to the proposed dock and requested variances as drawn in the space provided above. There are no variances drawn in the space provided above. This, these are the variances that should have been included in that form. She left our home. We signed it based upon the fact that we're only agreeing to four feet. That's the only number we had heard, four feet closer to us. She left with the unnotarized document. Then comes the fraud. I called Water and Navigation on October 3rd to check on the status of the permit. I was told it was approved and issued. I said, how could this be? My signature was not notarized. I was told that, yes, your signature was notarized by a Jennifer Parker. Jennifer Parker, we later learned, is an employee of Waterline Construction Company, the company that's building the dock. Now, when I made this notification, it was October 3rd, the construction had not started on the dock. We took an eight-day trip, came back, 
and we, we saw that construction was well underway. I called Water Navigation and said, you know, what happened? They said, well, they, they passed the matter up to County Legal because they couldn't make a decision. County Legal recommended they leave the permit as Mr. Doring signed the document and admitted to signing the document, which I did. Florida statute section 117.105 states very clearly, there is no exception to the presence requirement. You must have the person in front of you, and this is a violation of the statute and potentially a third degree felony. County legal, legal totally ignored the fact that water navigation was defrauded and the permit was, was issued, and only because of the fraud. I interviewed a few attorneys and one stated, Sir, what was he thinking? Your three minutes are up. Um, it's your. Could I disclose one other matter here of, of that? If you can. <laughs> this is the form that that she signed that was notarized, and there's a few problems with it here. Her name is misspelled. Jennifer is spelled G-E-N-N-F-E-R. You can see it right here. The P looks like a double take. They made a P, then a second P. Her. Notary stamp or notary expiration date is incorrect. It's not February 23rd. Uh, also stamped twice, and I don't understand that. So we basically have not only, I, I, we may have a problem here with this, with this notarization. <laughs> Lastly, this is an aerial that was included with the packet that you received. And the yellow lines are supposed to indicate the outline of the new dock. They do not. There's a, I put a, do, a, no, a line here. This would be approximately where it should be. I put a dark, a dark line out here. That indicates where it should have gone out to the intercoastal. Grossly understated. And again, to try and get this through and get it passed. I'd not like to pass this off to my wife, who's coming up next. Okay. Um, and Mrs. Doring, do you want to speak and continue? for three minutes. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Jan Doring. I reside at 226 Driftwood Lane, and I'd like to make a few comments that my husband didn't have time for. I don't know if I'm putting this in the right place. This is the form that Jody Patel brought over to us to sign. The dock looks very small and non-threatening due to the fact that the scale is 35 feet to the inch. The contractor left this out note the blank space. The only figure we were given was that the dock was going to be four feet closer to us than the present dock. We agreed, signed, and provided Fred's driver's license number, but we intentionally did not have it notarized. Both the Copernex and we were trying to be neighborly and to help our new arrivals. We did not want to interrogate them, but simply told, took them at their word we, but their actions were not as altruistic as ours. We did not expect this or see it coming. We were shocked that the new person in the neighborhood would immediately alienate the family surrounding them, particularly in the manner in which it was done. The county administrator, Mr. Barry Burton, sent a letter to this board, and we would like to contest this based on the fact that he was not provided with full and accurate information by the staff. The letter states, and I quote, the permit included a variance approval to allow for a larger and slightly wider dock than previously existed. We were not, we did not receive the variance data. The dock is 20 feet 5 inches wider. This is not slight. The letter also states, and I quote, since all the appropriate steps were followed to grant this permit, staff recommends that the board not approve the request for a public hearing appropriate steps, there was non-disclosure, there was misrepresentation, and there was fraud. If Mr. Burton had been given correct information, I suspect this letter would not endorse the action of the staff. This is the photo of what we see every day. You will note that the lift is at the end of the dock, and if you put a 36-foot boat on this lift, the boat will extend an additional 10 feet plus into the water, a total of over 60 feet. The view we have enjoyed for the past 21 years will be replaced with what is the equivalent of a billboard. 
Build it and apologize later. We suspect that this is the mentality of the Waterline Construction Company and maybe other builders. This dock needs to be ordered back to the original footprint. If you do, situations like we are experiencing will be deterred and you will also be uh, sending a very strong message to this industry. There is absolutely no chance that we or the Copernex would have agreed to this dock if we were given honest and complete information. Our property has been devalued and we are not happy and we ask the board to order this dock to be brought back to its original footprint. Thank you. Are there any questions anyone has or do you have any questions for our staff? <clears throat> Raheem Harji, Assistant County Administrator. Um, so again, just reiterating our position on this particular issue. Um, we believe all the steps were followed appropriately. Um, if you look at, and if you could switch over to the overhead projector for a second. This was the form that you saw earlier where it clearly shows the dimensions of the new dock, adjacent docks to provide a scale of reference, was signed off as um, Mr. Doring stated as well. All of the steps that were required to issue the dock permit were followed. Um, there is a 30 day appeal period where anybody can appeal the permit. Uh, the dock owners were aware of that but chose to begin construction. Our staff recommendation continues to be that we do not hold the public hearing. So the dock is built to the specification shown on the? Yes, it is submitted materials when they applied? Yes. Kelly Levy, uh, Interim Public Works Director. Additionally, when we went out and our staff did the final um, construction inspection, the <coughs> lift was actually moved a foot inward. So it's, um, it's, even, it's, it's a slightly smaller than um, actually shown on the plans to move it a little closer. Okay. Commissioner? Justice then Commissioner Welch. Just, just out of curiosity, I mean, the beyond our process, it, I mean, it's, they have some pretty serious allegations um, about the paperwork. If three months that they they follow that up and it's proven that it was a, for lack of a better word, fraudulent application with the notarization, would we then require them to tear down the dock? So we'd, I'd have to defer to legal on this, but again, we, from the documents we have, we believe we have everything we need. If there is some fraudulent activity, that's a civil matter between the two neighbors, um, we would have to address it at that time. I do not foresee that we would revoke the permit on that basis. I can, a point of reference in history, um, part of the reason why you have the requirement in the first place in your code that those statements be signed is to verify that the neighbor actually signed it. Um, I remember sitting here in a public hearing one day when one of those was presented back when you saw all these at public hearings and a form was presented that stated that a neighbor signed it and the neighbor had not in fact signed it and was watching the public hearing and that's the only reason why we found out. So the notary provision was written into your code so that staff could have assurance that the neighbors did actually sign it and you have two neighbors here who admitted to signing these forms. Doesn't, doesn't the notary have to witness them sign it? I do not. I am not well versed in notary law. Supposed I apologize. And the, and the date has to be correct. And so, uh, <coughs> again, um, based on the information we have, you know, we, that would be a civil matter between the two neighbors, not, not something related to the permit we have. Yeah, the actual, the actual <coughs> section of the code watch. refers to um, that, the, that we need to have signed statements of no objection from both adjacent waterfront property owners, um, not notarized. That was something that was added in later on, but the code doesn't actually require a notarized okay. statement. I think I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner. So I just want to be very clear so that the folks that just came and spoke that the size of the dock that was purported in the plan that they signed is what is being built. That's correct. That is correct. And it's not any closer 
to their property than the four feet that was in the document that said their dock would not be closer than four feet to their property. That was a statement um, that Mr. Doring advised county staff that the Patels told them we are not privy to anything oh. in writing. Um, again, the the permit that Raheem has here has all of the dimensions, um, the measurement um, from the property line to the adjacent dock, the even the um, Patel the Patel's dock compared to the Doring's dock compared to um, the Coburnick dock, as in scale, so that you can see um, size, dimensions, lengths. Um, in fact, only a very small portion of the structure on the Doring side actually felt within a variance criteria. Um, what they had out there was actually fairly small. That, that's the 52 feet 7 inches is the, the new dock to the property line. No, this we're talking about this dock, Commissioner. Oh, I'm sorry. The one we're right here. in the middle. So, yes. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Left to right. I get, let me get from middle to right. It's how I can't read that writing. What is that distance? <coughs> oh, yeah, that. What does that number say down there? Fifteen. What? You're talking about from the red line. No, no, no. To back, go, no, no. I'm sorry. Back on the right side. This is the, the the one in red is the one we're talking about. Yes. Correct. Okay. Yeah. This is the one that was the one in red is the one was that was constructed. And the the Dorings live here to the south okay. of the Patels. Okay. So just to reiterate your point, what you see on this permit application that was signed off is what has been built out there with a slight modification where this lift is a little further in. Okay. And the distance from the edges, or the edge of the, of the dock to the property line has changed is that what's now is it the changed? same as you see on this drawing and with the that same that was there before no so what was there before this was the area that you could see it what was there before is what you see in the aerial okay and what was permitted is what you see in yellow and and what's that distance that that yellow on the on the top the top you see from that? here to here no. On the bottom? Just on the top yellow line, the one at the north. Yeah. No, no. Keep going. I'm sorry. To the right. To the right. Oh, uh, right. I'm not explaining it well. <laughs> um, it's towards the northern the, dock. To the other owner's property. There's two lines that are, like, parallel to each other, and there's a little clearance in between the two lines. What is that distance? What is that? Yeah. This might help. So you're talking about the distance from the property line? No. No, on the top part of the. Okay. Your lunch is. No. Oh, yeah. This. What is this width? This. This gap the between what is there, what was there, and what is now there. This. So the distance between this and that. Yeah. Excuse me. Can I put this form up? This will give you all the information. So he's asking for the distance between. You. <laughs> yeah, Commissioner, I guess we'd have to go get that, that I distance. Have it right here. Okay. What? Okay. Let. You have to move right David. The old dock is, is in the first column, and then we have the new dock and the change. You had asked about the left side to my property line. No, it was actually, you're on the other side. I was actually looking at the oh, other. the right side. I'm sorry. Okay, the right side. Uh, was 29 the, feet from 29 the 29 feet, and now it's 18 feet 7. So they moved it in 10, 10 feet 5 inches. Right. And that what was, that's what was purported in the original plan. Yes. So there's no surprises there. Well, except that that's a variance. And the variance are not depicted above, which, which this form states. They just sent us a picture of, of the new dock. We had no frame of reference. They didn't show the old dock from which we get. I had to calculate this from afterwards from the permit. Okay. They didn't show, I didn't know, I had no idea. I don't carry the code in my head. So when I saw that dock, I had no idea how that would compare to code. I also didn't have the, uh, the footprint of the original dock to be able to do this 
to calculate these numbers. So, What I was told was four feet, verbally, from Mrs. Patel. It will be four feet closer to us. It turned out to be nine feet five yeah. inches. Where is this from? Whose is this? I is developed this? that. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. Just wanted to make sure I understood where the, because I've asked about the four feet a couple of times and yeah. we're not hearing anything from staff exactly, about yeah. four feet. So The only number we had was four feet, but these are the true variances. But the only they, number you had verbally from them was four feet. That's correct. Okay. But when, what, they, when the plan got put together, yeah. it didn't reflect four feet. Exactly. Now, when I'm looking at that, well, at the original form. Wait, wait, yeah. If I could, if I could just Trina. clarify something. No one is under any obligation to sign a variance form or a waiver of, of objection. And um, at no time was Mr. Doring, you know, did he could have asked the Patels, let me take this back and let me review it. And, um, you know, but he didn't. And he elected to sign that waiver. He, he, you know, said to be a good neighbor. And I understand that, but we're kind of... The, the, issue, the issue is, I think, pretty clear, okay? I mean, Mr. Dorian, he was handed a picture. He, it has the dimensions on it. What he's showing you is, is he had to go and calculate. So he signed it not fully understanding the impact of what he signed. Okay? Except and, that. And, and, late, still, yeah, and when feet. you came back after eight days, you start, then you now it piqued your interest and you started yeah. looking at, at those dimensions. Exactly. And that's and that's because I've went back and forth a couple of times with him over the last couple of days trying to understand this because I want to understand what you know what we're requiring, what we're taking in as staff and how we and how we have that approval process. And that's where I think, you know, the it, it became unclear and you well, could my, see yeah, my options were limited. I like, called her a liar or you know, and this is a new neighbor. We're trying to be neighborly, we're being naive, yes. So but but the but the form the form did have the information. It was just not in a form that necessarily it had the dimensions. Well, for example, it said so. 52 feet, but was the other dock 52 feet, 40 feet, 60 feet? I had no idea. Okay. I had no frame of reference when I saw that dock. Okay. And they bring it over and they put it in your face and you know what do you do? So I asked, what am I varying? What am I accepting? And she said three feet. Excuse me, four feet. Well, at first she said, I don't know. Okay. And she went home, came back, and said four feet. Okay, Mr. But Thank it's really nine feet, five inches. That let, was one let dimension. The, let the commissioners deliberate. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, any other questions? Um. Well, I guess I, if I may, what options do we have here? We have the ability to have a public hearing to deny the dock. But the dock has already been built. Correct. Or you have the option of um, denying the public hearing and letting the dock stay. And I guess stop. the most important issue to me is that... <clears throat> The, what was submitted to the county was built as was submitted to the county. That is correct. With the correct footage and everything. That is correct. Based on the permit application that was submitted and approved by the county that included sign-offs from both of the neighbors, what is built out there matches those plans. So that's... That's the um, situation. Is there any more discussion or questions, or do you have? There was a, uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> a diagram up there just a second ago about um, what parts of that needed variances. Yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't sure who had that. Um, So Sir, referring to this one? No, yeah. I'm not. Okay. I'm talking to the staff. Yeah, so what you're looking at here is um, essentially when the staff review the permit, what's inside the red box, um, if you build a structure that's totally within that red box, it conforms to all code, it would not require anything. Um, what required a variance on 
the Doring side, so Mr. Doring is to the south here, right. is the lift that stuck out here right. and a little bit of length here. The majority of the variance was here on Dr. Kobernick's side um, there. So that's that's the level of variance that it that So it really, it, I mean, it seems, well, from one of the um, emails that we got that there was some distress over the length of the pier was somewhat longer than it was before, but that was yeah. almost 100% within what they could have built without any other permission. Within that red so, box that you see. Right. I mean, it's just that when people build piers, you can't see through them for the most part. Sorry. But, yeah, I, okay. And this is typical of some of the docks that we see where you have right. a boat and you have the jet ski lift, so. Well, and he's also got an odd configuration where it has to come off on a on an angle there, so. That, 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 that uh, on the on the dooring side, could you put that back up yes. again? I just want to make sure I'm. How how much is that variance request? And it came in a foot from that request, didn't it? So if you were to just take the dimension from here to here, just for the purposes of discussion, from here to here, is we twelve feet. We can't see it. Um, we can see it up there. Sorry. The variance the, the variance <laughs> request itself is twelve feet, or the distance. So this area that's. I'm hatching right now hmm. would be the variance request for the doorings. It's 12 feet. Which is less than 12 feet. And it's come in a foot. It's come in a foot, yes. Okay. Because that's the dimension of that lift, so. And is there any, any uh, uh, issues on the other side um, that you're aware of? If it's issues based on Ms., uh, Dr. Kubernick appealing, he had the same concerns, yes, but he's not here today. Okay. Concerns being the size of it. Yes. But again, he also signed the same form. Right. right. That shows the dimensions and um, the relativity of the dimensions between his dock and the proposal. Okay. That, and um, that variance on the other side, mm -hmm. uh, if that's 12 feet on this side, now 11 since it came in a foot what is it on the other side do you know it'd probably be about the same just from looking at the scale of the drawing about 12 as well probably around that dimension and so they've really widened the dot more than they've lengthened it yeah they've lengthened they've done both from their existing dock configuration they've made oh, that's it wider right. they have, and long yeah yeah but the variance is more in the width yeah in the width side so their dock is it on the on the on that north side or whatever is was in in the needed a variance as well the yes, existing yes. dock and that variance was signed off by the neighbor to the north the original variance I'm talking about the uh, the original dock that's there was further at, further it was beyond the red line as well it was but that dock was built a long time ago okay a very long time ago. okay uh, the point is is it was almost as yes. wide as yeah. what they're asking for. Sure. based so, on the aerials that you see yeah yeah okay. Well, and I think it's pretty much in scale with the other dock to the south of it. I mean, it's it's slightly larger, but yes, it's, not much. Yeah. Just that little. Anyone else? Yes, sir. Uh, if you're ready, I, I think we've adhered to our process, and I would move staff's recommendation of denial. Second. Okay, there's a <clears throat> motion by Commissioner Welch um, and a second by Commissioner Gerard to deny the uh, public hearing. Whoops, wait a minute. Well, we're approving That's very to misleading. Deny, right? <laughs> okay. We're Motion should be to deny we're the authority to advertise. Right. Which is, isn't that staff's recommendation? Yeah. yeah. I move staff's recommendation. That is staff's recommendation. recommendation. Yeah. yeah. Deny. Which was to deny. So you were supporting staff's recommendation. 
you're approved <coughs> to deny. It's stop. just not how it appeared on the screen. Yeah, I just want to make sure that it's clear for the record. We're approving the denial. You're approving to deny. Your action is to deny. Action is to deny. Is to deny. <laughs> yeah. Is the the action item is authority yeah. to advertise? Right. Recommendation is denied, but Nine the action is approved. <laughs> so that's why I wanted to make sure. Gerard. I did, and that's what I meant. So, so <laughs> voting yes is denying the application. Correct. Yes. yes. That was the. Okay. Uh, Thank you. No doc. <clears throat> doc. There we go. Okay, that's a unanimous decision, um, and um, thank you for being here. I hope that you all can figure, can move forward at this point, and enjoy being neighbors. Okay, um, agenda item forty. This is renewal of certificates of public convenience and necessity for advanced life support providers. There are twenty-four agencies listed. Move approval. Second. second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Eggers. <clears throat> That's unanimous. Agenda item 41. Uh, this is a resolution implementing a yellow dot critical motorist medical identification identification program within Pinellas County. Um, the statute allows the county to create a program and encourages municipal governments to undertake the program. The city of Largo, through its police department, wishes to create the program and has asked us to uh, adopt it. Uh, this would allow for a decal to be placed in the back window of, of a participant's vehicle that and they put their medical information on a form inside their glove compartment indicating to a first responder Check. that medical information is available. Move approval. Like Santa Claus, Second. Second. Commissioner Long is the motion um, mover and Commissioner Gerard is the second. The only thing, and we had this discussion a bit at work session, but um, you know, we really need to make sure that we have communication amongst <coughs> all of the um, <coughs> emergency medical community and the cities to make sure that they know this program is being implemented. As we talked about, you cross into another mm -hmm. city's border and right. they may not be aware of it. They'll like to see us and we'll, ask the EMS board or whoever. Yeah, we'll, we'll send this back. This was a recommendation from the EMS Advisory Council, and so right. we'll send that back okay. to them for an expansion of the program and okay, good. them to look into it. All right, great. So, Craig, I don't think you were there the other day. Do we still ha provide those um, folders that people can list their medications and leave it on their refrigerator? We do. So we'll kind of refresh Come on all up. of this. So we can educate the commissioners and the public. Good afternoon. Craig here, Safety and Emergency Services. Uh, we will use this as an opportunity to refresh the vial of life. Yes. And uh, the, the ones that go life. on the refrigerator and then communicate this out to everyone on the yellow dot. Okay, perfect. Very good. All right, thank you. We're ready. It's like, okay, that's unanimous. Agenda item 42. This is a resolution to receive emergency medical services trust fund monies for pre hospital emergency for, um, um, services, emergency medical services. This would be grant revenue of $139,776 to be awarded by the state uh, trust fund. Uh, this would provide for a software to track controlled substances and daily inspections of medical equipment, pharmaceuticals, and supplies. Move approval. Second. <coughs> Motion by Commissioner Welch, second by yeah. Commissioner Long. Question, just real quick. You have a question? Yes. Yeah. Um, so this is a, a, a one-time award for 139 to get it uh, fully, of well, the estimates for 246, right? I just want to make sure I get the money. Then there's an annual ongoing cost that we're right. going to have to account for. That's correct. So we'll have to have the annual maintenance. This would provide one-time money to kind of get the program going. And that'll come from it'll come from that fund from their yeah from the EMS fund. Okay, all right. 
Thank you. And follow up. Mm -hmm. This is tracking controlled substances. So is it is it the controlled substances of the patient, or is it controlled substances that we control in our units? Good afternoon, Jim Fogarty, Director of Safety and Emergency Services. This is a software platform that uh, tracks the controlled substances that the paramedics have on the ambulances and the fire trucks. Some, some agencies, such as Pinellas Park, have a local uh, software platform, and they've uh, shown some success. This is an effort to expand that on a county basis, countywide basis. And so that's for, so that we don't, <coughs> I guess I'm just, we're, we're losing controlled substances now or we don't know, or is it just the requirements to process it are so laborious that we need the software? This, this uh, takes what now is a pretty regimented manual process and uh, changes it to electronic for ease of tracking. Okay. Um, I can't move approval. <laughs> I, but don't we already have a motion and a second on this? Do we? Um, we do, right? We do? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Could, could I ask one more question? Sure. Just, just on a question I asked you months ago, and we, I know you've kind of come back to me. Just one more time on the, uh, the alternative on board our paramedic stations for uh, the alternative to the, the um, narcotic use for pain relief do we so um, you, do we have that on do we have alternatives available there are a, a few alternatives that are being reviewed uh, dr. Jamison our medical director is closely monitoring what Pasco County is doing as a okay. alternative to the use of fentanyl uh, but there has not been any uh, studies that support or refute uh, that's so they're still approach. studying, still the, studying. That's the Pasco County. That's correct. So it's still potentially will be considered. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Just thank you for the update. Okay. Do you have any more questions, comments? Yeah, ready. More software. Great. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, missing. Need to vote. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. That was unanimous. Hey, item 43. Item 43 is a one-year incre uh, increase in, for, to the agreement with Oracle America for the requirements of software licensing and maintenance, and this is our primary financial um, uh, enterprise-wide system. Move approval. Second with a question, please. Go for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. So as we discussed at the briefing, um, this is a one-year extension. It is. We mentioned the clerk's um, questions about outsourcing um, support going forward, and I think OBAC was going to meet earlier this week. Did that? They actually they actually met earlier. Okay. Um, they uh, and so they're going to um, s slow down approval of the um, privatization piece to that, and while they try to address some of the concern uh, the clerk's concerns. We, I met with the clerk earlier also, and we talked about, you know, I think the real need to have countywide strategic vision for our main systems, all of our systems, not just Oracle. Um, but with a particular emphasis on coming back and reviewing Oracle, we put that in in 1998. And uh, so <laughs> it's it served its useful life. And, and it's also a change from when we were putting these types of s systems in in 1998, you were trying to get systems to talk to each other now that's not the case and so you can have systems that still don't require duplicate data entry and all that thing and, and they and they work together and so there's a lot more flexibility in terms of how we address business um, um, interest of varying departments and so for instance we have a separate area uh, issue we're looking at with our budgeting piece but that feeds in and, and talks to Oracle same way with purchasing and so you know we're so but we're gonna address the immediate concerns, make sure he's he's comfortable with making sure that there's proper support for Oracle um, during this period, look at Oracle as a system, but then develop a countywide strategic plan for all of our IT systems. Are we still negotiating with the third party vendor in parallel? Yes. Okay. So, can I just follow up on sure. it? Um, so, right now we're approving an increase of of 
what is it? Two point two point two million dollars. Right. With the possibility of having a, a million dollars less it, if it, we do uh, secure the third party. That's correct. We would save money, but we're also continuing to look at Oracle to say, can we neg renegotiate their prices? Um, for a period of time, or is it this third-party vendor that we would use? So and we're uh, we're authorizing up to that much. That's correct. Um, and, and there's and fully there's, anticipating, fully anticipating less money. I certainly hope so. Okay. But but I need to address the clerk's concerns to make sure yeah. that his uh, that I mean, for instance, you're you don't have the Oracle support. You're applying patches from a third party rather than from Oracle. So what does that mean in terms of making sure that the system operates in functionality? That's his concerns. We need to address those prior to making a decision how we go forward. We don't have much time. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Was there, I'm sorry, was there a motion in a second? Yes, there was. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it passes six to zero, and now we are moving on to agenda item 44. Agenda item 44 is an emergency medical services advanced life support first responder growth management agreement with Pinellas Suncoast Fire and Rescue District. Move approval. Second. Are you motion by Commissioner Long? Who's the second by? Commissioner Welch. Okay. Ready for the voting cards? Okay, six to zero. Um, agenda item 45. This is issuance of certificates of public convenience and necessity for non-medical wheelchair <coughs> transport and stretcher van providers. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Eggers. Okay, passes unanimously. Uh, reappointment number 46, reappointment to the EMS board. Move approval. Second. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Gerard. I didn't even get Barry to I'm announce good. it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, passes unanimously. Moving on to agenda item 47. County Attorney. Under 47, I am not going to be act asking you to take action today on this item. Um, if you recall, we, this is the item where you all were able to read the confidential memorandum on Thursday. Subsequent to your workshop on Thursday, staff was able to settle this matter within the delegated authority you have provided to staff. So you do not need to take action on this item. Since it was on the agenda and we had discussed it on Thursday, I did not simply want to pull it. But there's no need for action at this time. However, on 48, I am seeking your approval to initiate litigation in the uh, referenced action. This will be a code enforcement action. Move approval. Second. Second. Commissioner Welch and Commissioner Gerard. Thank you. Okay, passes unanimously. Uh, agenda item 49. Under 49, I would like to make a brief announcement. Um, I do have, I'm proud to say, another board certified attorney on my staff. Uh, Brendan Mackesy was here for an agenda item earlier, so I asked him to stick around so we could recognize him. <laughs> We are, you know, I, I have mentioned it before, but it is a rigorous process that the attorneys go through as far as a peer review and exam that is not an easy exam. Um, and I am happy to say we are more than 50% board certified um, with the attorneys in my office at this point. Awesome. Great. great. Congratulations, Brandon. Congratulations, Brandon. Brandon. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you. 50? Do you have any county administrator reports? Well, since I have the jacket, um, but I figured this would be this would be the time just to wish all of our employees and to the commission uh, a very happy holidays. It's been a tremendous year. Uh, just passes, you know, one year, and uh, 
Um, you know, I, I left a family, but I gained a family, and uh, Kathy and I are very, very happy to be mm -hmm. here working with such a fabulous team. And so thank you very much. All right. Nice. Okay. Um, 51 is state legislative program. Brian. <sighs> As always, you put it together a nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Brian Lowak coming to you today as the Intergovernmental Liaison. And before you, I bring a proposed 2020 state legislative priorities document. This document was comprised uh, as a result of conversations I had with individual commissioners, county staff, our state government uh, relations contract team, and our local delegation here in Pinellas County. Well, this is not a comprehensive list of all of our priorities and uh, adv advocacy efforts in Tallahassee. Uh, this will serve as a guide for specifically me and our contract lobby firm. In addition to this, um, as many of you know, because you were part of the process, Florida Association of Counties, which we remember, uh, recently, um, uh, recently voted on and adopted their 2020 legislative advocacy program, including their guiding principles uh, and their priority issues. And finally, um, through our legislative tracking program, uh, I'm notified of every piece of legislation that is filed uh, during the session. I then assign it to a, one of our 40 analysts throughout the county, and uh, they provide feedback to me. We then take that and relay that to uh, the legislators, and all that combined makes our legislative uh, advocacy program. But with that, uh, I can answer any questions you have. Madam Chair? Yes. Um, I, I mentioned it the other day, and if you could just maybe talk me through, talk me down off the edge on this on this one item about, uh, about some of the, um, I guess, uh, stormwater uh, collection system that we have uh, overtaxing our sewer plants and therefore creating a lot of problems. So. Uh, whether it's the laterals in people's homes and a program associated with that, or whether it's our own systems that are in place, um, or whether it's trying to get people off of septics um, onto, and onto the system, there's nothing in any of that. And that's really one of the truly black marks that we get, so to speak, in, in this county when we start looking at some of the issues that when we get heavy rains and our sewer plants are overflowing, um, nothing in here about that and I just think that's really an important part we continue to espouse the importance of it and you know if we're going to support funding for the arts and culture which I agree with I think our infrastructure piece as it relates to that needs to be a high guiding principle for us so and that's missing so I I'd, I'd like to add um, I know top 10 looks good um, but you know if you're the 10th team and you want to be the 11th team in I think that's that's not bad either I just think we ought to have something in there regarding that item Sure, and um, I could tell you, in addition to that being an issue here in Pinellas County, that's a statewide issue. All three of those that you mentioned, laterals, uh, stormwater systems, county stormwater systems, and getting folks off of septic and getting them on, on right. sewer. Um, that is a high priority in FACTS legislative program. Uh, I can tell you there are pieces of legislation that we're tracking. One of our local legislators here, Senator Brandis, uh, is carrying forward a um, sewer lateral bill, which is actually in its second committee hearing today. <laughs> We're very active uh, with him and our um, property appraiser, Mike Twitty, on the language in there. Um, so that's how we'll be addressing the laterals. Uh, and uh, in addition to the m many bills that are filed uh, for stormwater, uh, we're tracking all of that. And uh, I can assure you that uh, that is not going to go by the wayside. I understand. I still think, for some reason, it makes me feel better that when Pinellas County has as one of its guiding principles those items, no matter what's happening up there. Sometimes we do things that we're in agreement with. Uh, but I think it needs, it's, to me it's at the core of what we're doing wow. here. One of the problems that we have that I'd like to see on there. So, so what does the um, lateral bill say? So uh, Roughly uh, to give you a, synop a quick synopsis of it, it basically says uh, it encourages local governments to come up with a, a way to address <laughs> private uh, lateral lines. Uh, right now, uh, we don't have that. Uh, there are some legal issues on this, Brilliant. but this bill specifically encourages it. And one of the big um, um, parts of the bill is at the end, it would require um, the notification of any deficiencies in private laterals uh, at, the, at the time of sale. 
Um, so through that, um, yeah, that may provide an avenue yeah. to address those. Really. Madam Chair, Commissioner Justice, Commissioner Welch, and then I'll come back to this side to Commissioner Long. And what, what is the, and one, I think we should pass the ordinance encouraging the state legislature to solve the problem too. So yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> what is the, the deadline for filing of appropriations bills? Are it, we In the House, it's November 15th, which is passed. In the Senate, uh, there is no deadline. Right, okay. And I think, I mean, that's, um, and, and I think, Commissioner Eggers, if this was your, your point, that in past we've asked for specific projects that dealt with that subject area that, I mean, would you be looking for us to request funding for, you know, a um, upgrade at the Cross Bayou plan or some of those kind of things that we have been doing in our normal programming? Would you suggest we... Well, any of that. We don't have any specific projects listed here either. But I think we need to continue exploring all of that, all, all, all of those three things, continuing to explore the lateral funding issue continue exploring how we tighten up the, no, no, yeah, our no, own no. systems. But, you know, again, we have to do our part of it in getting people off the of septics. Those are all programs that we're working on ourselves, but also trying to get state assistance on. So, And, and I think that's, I mean, and I've been saying this since I've been here, is that, um, and you have to, Brian and our contract folks can, can let us know what the priorities of leadership are, whether it's this year it's criminal justice, some years water projects, it, it varies from transportation, it varies from leader to leader. But if there's areas that they're interested in that they'll fund that can relieve our normal funding of that we could shift to other or move up things on that list, that's what we should be going for as well. Okay. Sure. Yeah, so I just had the same question when you said encouraging local government, so I was waiting for the funding piece to come. Mm, so right. is there any funding recommended in that? Uh, no, there's not, but there is language in that bill, and I believe I, I may have this, but there is language in there that it... Um, um, it in, again encourages local governments to come up with that uh, a funding avenue because right now it's on private property we can't go on there to detect it uh -huh. we also can't pay for it because it's on private property so this would allow us uh, the ability to come up with a a system to, to you know come up with ideas how can we do that can we finance that at, at time of sale um, right now there's there's nothing I know St. Pete did something recently they did. Uh, for private laterals. Any other cities just um, that, moved on that? Not, you know? not that I know, but I can tell you our utilities team, uh, as well uh, as a result of the wastewater task force, um, these are all things that they're currently working on, um, and they've been very engaged with um, the bill sponsor on that. Yeah. Gulfport has, a, a, I believe, a grant program to help homeowners pay for their laterals. Do we um, have an analysis of the types of piping in the unincorporated area? This is getting out of my wheelhouse. Um, <laughs> <laughs> not to my knowledge. We do. Come on, Brian. With, with Clay or Orangeburg? <laughs> uh, Raheem said, yes, we do. He says, yes, we do. Yes, we do? Can I hear just a little bit about and that? Laterals? Come on, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Great job, Brian. <laughs> So, uh, Commissioner Wells, just to clarify, are you talking about the laterals or are you talking about our main trunk lines? The laterals. The laterals. Um, we have what's in our system. We don't know what's on the private system. Just for the sheer fact that we can't go into private property. Now, we may have an idea based on the age of the home, what type of pipe is there. There's a bunch of different ways you can tell what it is, um, but we don't know 100% what's out there. Have we looked at any um, programs to help detect leaks and yes. uh, so, we, so do we, use, we do smoke testing for mm -hmm. example yeah. um, that basically like you bunch of part of, push a bunch of smoke and if it comes out of the ground you know there's a leak if it comes out of the house and there isn't the times uh, describe that as being pretty ineffective in their it's a tool articles. in the toolbox that... I mean there's a bunch of different ways the best way to do it is by TVing the line Okay. Um, and we don't TV private laterals. I mean, we might know when we're TVing our line because we can see up the lateral up to the cap, um, but we don't have a proactive program to TV private lines for the sheer fact that they're private. Okay. But there are programs in place to assist. Uh, Commissioner Justice mentioned the one that uh, Gulfport has uh, where they pay for like 50% of the replacement of the private lateral. Um, there's, you know, St. Pete has like the self program, which offers low-cost financing options for homeowners to replace it. So we're looking at similar types of programs. And so self-covers private laterals? Yep. 
Yeah. And things. at some point, I'd like to know where we are with that because we've yeah. talked about that for a while. Yeah. Bringing that back. So anyway. So there's a bunch of different tools we have. Okay. Thank you. Looking into. Commissioner Long. Uh, yes, my my comments are for Brian because I think you were with me when we heard that fabulous presentation about water and the projections for water consumption and where we'll be in the next 10, 15 years and the lack of funding that Tallahassee is paying attention to the dollars that they put into this subject matter. Do you remember that? I mean, it yeah. was, it was I, unbelievable. I don't recall the exact numbers, but I know. I don't have it. In, I have it in my paperwork, high. but I don't have it with me this afternoon. But I'd like to see if at some point we could have a presentation for the whole commission about that particular subject matter that he spoke about that afternoon, because I just thought it was so important that at some point we put our eyeball on that. Certainly. Okay, anybody else? I would entertain a motion for Commissioner May, <laughs> may I ask, um, would we like to add Commissioner Egger's suggestion to this at this point? Is, it, is there that direction? Sure. Sure. Okay. For the sewers. Yeah, yeah. sewers and, okay. and septics and including guiding. private laterals in there mm -hmm. under the guiding principles. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, we got rid of the horses, remember, <laughs> on our beaches. They brought that up for crying out loud. Everybody brings up our sewer problems. So, right. so to the extent that we can have another partner in this, it would be helpful. Yes. Move approval with the added 11th <laughs> uh, guiding principle of support for infrastructure <laughs> projects, including those mentioned by Commissioner Eggers. Second. Okay. A motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Welch. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, that's a unanimous decision. Next is the uh, parks um, agenda item 52, Commissioner Justice, individual appointment. This is Mr. Schuler, my individual appointment as well as Commissioner Peters, Youth Advisory Committee nominee, and I would move approval. Second. Okay, plus the, thank you. Okay, motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. Okay, that's a unanimous decision. <clears throat> um, next, we have ballots for the Housing Finance Authority. Um, and looking at the backgrounds, I did notice that one um, individual has quite extensive experience with affordable tax credit multifamily properties, hmm. and that was Mary Kim Wagner, so I just thought I'd mention that. Um, and that was a question on that. Uh, is that the person that uh, was not living or working in Pinellas County? I, I, she lives I, in Palm Harbor. Oh, I'm sorry, that, maybe that wasn't the one. It was another one. Okay, thank you. Make sure I... Okay, I don't have the... Uh... Do we have the ballots? Ballots? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. We haven't passed out the ballots She's yet. She's got them. Little drummer boy now. Or what? Right, so much coffee. Right. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh, just one. I mean, I expect you to. Go. She lives in Palm Harbor. Yeah, yeah. I had the wrong. Person. Okay. Remember to put your name on it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. <clears throat> Next, we have the appointment to the Unified Personnel Board, and it, it's um, Ken Peluso is a 
Reappointment, his initial appointment date was 11 20 2018. He is the only applicant. So I think we can do it by motion. Do approval. approval. Second. Second. Okay, Commissioner Justice made the motion, and I'll. Here we go. Commissioner Eggers made the second. You all chimed in at once. That was wonderful. Meeting's getting long. And we now have another ballot. This is for the Value Adjustment Board. And Frank Mikoski is the current um, member. We need ballots for that too. <clears throat> oh, right. Next, we have the Historic Preservation Board, and um, choose one. <laughs> They're piling up down yeah. here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm being thoughtful. Don't look at me like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 26 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that was the longest one last time. Yeah. So one, two, twenty-six. Really? Choose five. We're just eliminating one. Right. They're not, well, they're not a resident, so they can't, right? Maybe they're a stakeholder. She's a stakeholder. Okay. Yes, and Lilman, choose five. Well, that one you can do fast. Yeah, that, <laughs> would you believe this is the one I meant? <laughs> was it a resident or a business owner? <laughs> I knew there was one in there. <laughs> More coming. Yeah, she's uh, swamping her over there. Craft beer place downtown. Yeah, we don't have any of that anywhere in the county. But mine would be different. <laughs> Than all the others that are down there. Okay. We should. So I missed that. The mural door. Hold on. Agenda item 58 is appointments and reappointments to the Feather Sound Community Services District. They are individual appointments, but I'm, unless anybody has any objection, we, I think we can take them as an entirety. Okay. Move approval. Second. Okay, um, Commissioner Justice and second by Commissioner Gerard on agenda item 58. <clears throat> 
Commissioner Peters. I'm sorry. Peters did the second. Yeah. Sorry. Correct the record, please. Okay, six to zero, it passes. Um, next is assignments to agenda item 59, assignments to the 2020 committees and boards by the chair elect. Mm. Too late to change it now. <laughs> Too late? <laughs> <laughs> Unless you have a serious Not objection. even sure we, we have to vote on it. That's yeah. what, you're, what you get to do. Oh. Well, you can <laughs> see them right there. Come talk vote? to me later if you're really, I don't <laughs> Do we vote or not? I don't think looking so, at right? the board's and committee assignments. I have been looking at it, working with Commissioner Gerard's assistant, going through all of the boards and committees and seeing which ones are chair appointment and which ones are commission appointments. Let me recommend that you just vote on this slate because we're working on getting great clarity to all of them on a good okay. basis. <laughs> but for now, let me recommend you just vote to approve. So move. Well, Commissioner Gerard, would move you? approval. <laughs> second. second. Okay, motion by Commissioner Gerard and second by Commissioner Long for agenda item 15. It's a lot of committees. Okay. All right, unanimous approval. Um, and then moving on to agenda item. 60 county commission new business um i think commissioner long you had a fix -a appointment yes um what did I do with it? well we have it here it is uh philip wagner that i would like to appoint so moved second okay motion Thank by you. commissioner long and second by mm -hmm. commissioner eggert Gerard. Gerard. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm just not. Okay. Unanimous approval. Um, are there any other county commission new business items? Uh, no. Okay. All right, then I'll start with board reports and miscellaneous item, which is 61, and I'll start with Commissioner Gerard. Um, okay. You have a last chance to go first. I, uh, yeah. Well, that's true. Let's see. Um, I don't think we've had any meetings of substance. Um, I did go to a tour of the St. Pete Pier this week. It was really great, and you really should go. Oh, it's they're, fabulous. They're dying to give you a, a tour. They are. They've got you something won, for you? everyone. Oh, you didn't go yet. Here. Aren't you scheduled? Yeah, you are. We have you on the schedule. You should go. Mm -hmm. It's really going to be fabulous. Um, way different than the other one, than the old one. Um, I wanted to thank Kelly Levy. She's not here anymore, but she gave me a tour of the uh, Lake Seminole Dredge Project last month, and I forgot to say anything about it. Um, that's fascinating as well. I wanted to thank everyone for the chair appointment next year, I think. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk to you at the end of December. I, I don't know. For the way you guys are talking, I'm, wow. I do have a couple of things from that. Um, we're going <laughs> you know, remember we talked about doing a, a, a ring-in system. Well, we have one here that we're going to try on our Granicus where it says request to speak. Um, we're going to try it. You mean instead of the cards? No, no instead, instead of for us. Like, so if you oh. want to talk, you okay. press the button, then I have a list of people that want to talk on that. And that comes up in a queue, similar to what we yeah. do at Didn't PSTA. you try to do it? Oh. I tried to do it when I was chair. But we were new with Granite. We were then. new and we were just <laughs> taking it. it doesn't, if it's a total disaster, we'll do something else. <laughs> um, but we'll try It'll it. Be we're going to try it next month. Do. Um, also, I would like to move the uh, board reports, not the new business, but the board reports where we're reporting out on all the meetings that we go to, to the briefings. 
That's a great idea. Because it's you mean really to about work session briefings. Yeah, great idea. Because it's really about talking to each other about what's going on, yeah. rather than the public. I mean, if you want to report wonderful things that are happening in the community, that's great. But I think it should move. So you're still going to have that part at the end oh. about the community. Well, yes, yeah. No? Okay. If there's anything, yeah. But otherwise, you know, the your board reports will put up. Yeah. We'll do it in the. Uh, <coughs> yeah. I think we have more time to ask questions and and have so a conversation. Rushed. Right. Some of this stuff is really important. And I'm really hoping that Commissioner Justice will continue to do pure Pinellas next year. I agree. We already have January booked for you. Oh, all right. Excellent. Um, and the only other thing I wanted to say is Happy Holidays, Happy New Year. You know, can't believe it's can't believe it, but Happy New Year. I know. <laughs> Mr. Justice. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Not a lot thank as far as the committees. I uh, really just wanted to thank everyone who was engaged in our holiday open house that we had at the exchange. Um, That's nice. Real estate management, uh, the folks down at the exchange, Chris Moore and his team there, uh, marketing and communications, and all of our commission uh, staff uh, really worked hard to, to make it a successful event, and we uh, appreciate everyone who was involved, and I thought it was a great day for everybody. So that was it, and happy holidays. Great. Okay, Commissioner Peters. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, I went to the uh, last of the three Gates Foundations for Economic Mobility, which was held in Maryland um, and Garrett County, which is very rural, and I didn't think I'd really learn something I could take back to an urban county, but I was so wrong. Um, they really have found an amazing way to help families empower families to break generational poverty and it's I'm really impressed with it um, and so I, when I have a chance I'll talk to Barry about it and see how we can replicate at least maybe in one community uh, whether it be Lelman or somewhere else. Lelman is kind of set up for it so it's kind of a perfect perfect opportunity but I'd love to do a pilot on it. I know we haven't budgeted anything but the way they did it uh, used resources that are already provided by to us by the federal government and the state government and so I'm really excited to talk to Barry about it and see if we can't do something to replicate it. Um, it's one of the pro one of the, out of the three places they took us. I didn't think a rural community would be the one that would excite me so much that it's that we can replicate. So um, I'm excited about that, and it was a great experience. And the Gates Foundation has agreed to renew it for another year, so there'll be three more communities around the country in which we'll go to see um, best practices for economic mobility. And I would recommend that if you think we're doing something over the top that I don't know about yet, we can also make maybe Pinellas County a stop. But um, other than that, I think more importantly, I want to thank all of you and the staff. Um, we've finished our first year, and it's been really fun and interesting and all kinds of all kinds of roller coaster stuff. But, um, you know, the, the all of your staff have been really helpful to my staff with Ashley, so thank you for that. You all have been patient and wonderful with me, so I truly, truly appreciate it, and I look forward to the next year that's coming. I can't believe how fast it went. <laughs> so, really fast. So thank you all, and um, happy holidays, and happy new year. Mr. Eggers. Thank you. Um, I'm mixing it up. Yes. yes. Shows. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, I wanted to um, extend my congratulations to Jake and um, his retirement, and I wish you and your family all the excitement. It sounds like it looks like you had a, a, a lot of fun things ahead of you with your kids, and Thank you for your service and coming back again and helping us out uh, over the last few years. So uh, God bless and uh, best of luck, uh, best wishes. Um, I will say that uh, miracles of miracles, I did get through my first Spanish class um, and uh, the exam was last week and I actually passed. It just goes to show any of you out there, no matter how old you are, you can go back to school and still learn and still pick up things. And um, it was just a lot of fun. We had a special project that took us out to our airport at the very end. And I wanted to thank uh, Tom uh, Jewsberry for allowing us to go into a couple places that we wouldn't normally get to go. Uh, but thank you to that, to that staff um, for that. Just a couple real quick things, um, announcements more than anything. Uh, Tarpon and Dunedin parades are on December 14th. Uh, Safety Harbor and Palm Harbor parades on, on December 21st. And Palm, Har Palm Harbor has a town hall meeting. Uh, it's going to be sponsored by the Ch uh, Chamber of Commerce to talk about education, information, and feedback on 
the Welch roundabout uh, <laughs> up on, um, I'm kidding, but the roundabout. So there will be some discussion trying to get some more input on that for our MPO uh, staff uh, and then FDOT. Lakeshore States is having a community meeting at St. Pete College Tarpon Campus on the 19th, which is coming up here in a few days at 5.30. Um, next year, right around the first week, uh, USF is having a State of the Region lunch on the 9th at 11.30 at University of South Florida. Uh, and I think that was all I had for announcements other than to wish everybody wonderful holidays, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, <coughs> and a healthy, happy, and prosperous 2020. We got a lot going on next year, so looking forward to working with all of you to get some things done for our residents. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Welch. Thank you. Um, so I think it's only fitting that I have a roundabout in North County <laughs> since um, Charlie just reminded me I have a hamburger in Clearwater, the Ken Welch <laughs> Burger. Is that what, Doc Ford's is it? Ford's Garage. Ford's Garage. There's a Ken Welch Burger. I hear it's really? great. Really? Yeah. So oh, I'm my God. Go and check it out. Um, <laughs> I will be touring the pier this week. It'll be my second time. The, the last time they actually put the straps on and I climbed the ladder to the top. I don't think I'm doing that again. Uh, but what a view looking back. And that is going to be a special project. Uh, long time coming. Uh, joined uh, several of you at FAC uh, Legislative. I thought that was very interesting. They had two uh, great sessions on the census and how that's going to impact us. Uh, there was an article in the Times about Florida's reluctance to have a statewide complete count effort where neighboring um, states like Georgia do, so that puts more of an impetus on us at the local level to make sure we have a complete count. And so our committees are working, uh, our staff is doing a great job, and I'm confident we're going to have a great turnout in Pinellas County. Uh, I want to end on, on a sad note. I know we've all uh, read about this, but just wanted to send uh, our thoughts out to the three uh, young sailors who lost their lives in Pensacola. I uh, wanted to read their names. 23-year-old uh, Kaleeb Watson, 21-year-old Cameron Walters, and then a son of Pinellas County, 19-year-old uh, Muhammad Mo Haytham, who um, they all died as heroes, um, protecting uh, their fellow sailors. And we certainly salute their bravery and their sacrifice. Uh, Mo was a Spartan. And our prayers go out to his family, Evelyn Brady, who is also a Navy veteran, and his father, Samay Haytham. Um, one of most family members works for the county, Eric Bell, mm. uh, in our marketing and communication staff. Okay. And uh, uh, Commissioner Eggers had talked about um, just how life takes us through different journeys. And Deborah uh, sent me, Deborah uh, Lansdowne, who takes our photos. Um, reminded me that she actually took a photo of Mo when I spoke at Lakewood for Great American Teaching just a couple years ago. Oh. And he's right there in the third row. And little did we know we were talking to a person that would be a hero for our nation in just a couple of years. So it just reminds us when we have those interactions, it's just to treat folks with love and respect. Yeah. You never know what journey they're on. So certainly our hearts uh, go out to them. I understand that There'll be a memorial of some type next week at Lakewood, and we'll certainly send that out as soon as we know about it. Great. So. Thank you, Commissioner Welch. That was Thank great. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Commissioner Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, business and Technology Services met this month, and there was a discussion about reinforcing the need for a larger discussion on technology and how to save money and be more efficient. So I look forward to that. The Tampa Bay Area Regional Transit Authority had their meeting this month at Tampa International Airport, and we got a good update from Joe Lapano on the new Tampa uh, International Airport's expansion plans. That new nine-story office building that there is under construction is just going to be great for that whole area. Scott Pringle from WSP is meeting with all of you, hopefully to discuss the five alternatives for the next phase of the regional BRT project. The public workshops are going on this month to get more public input, so more to come in January. Uh, PSTA has its next board meeting tomorrow. The next board meeting for Forward Pinellas is tomorrow. The executive committee is meeting. 
Uh, I also attended FAC with Commissioner Welch, and I won't go into that because he already did. The Regional Planning Council, don't forget that the dates for this first annual summit are January 7th and 8th. And if you haven't seen that agenda, it is going to be outstanding. We have national and international speakers who have uh, agreed to participate. There are pan there's a panel with the three mayors from the three largest cities. Our county administrators from the three counties will be on a panel. And uh, I think that you've all received hard copies of the most up-to-date agenda. And so please, please make sure that you come because, Commissioner Peters, if there's one thing I would encourage you to do is share what we're doing on climate change and sea level rise with your Gates Foundation work that you're doing. Because if you've been paying attention, that whole issue is taking front and center, not only here in Florida, but nationally and internationally. And um, I know we've had a busy day today, so I'm going to keep my remarks short. But I wanted to just touch a little bit on the opportunity that we had at the International Water Week in Amsterdam. Interestingly, some of the folks that we met there that are doing research and development on stormwater management and flooding uh, we're very excited about what we're doing here in Florida, and they're coming to participate in our summit and be sponsors of it. So that was, I was very impressed by that. Um, the main focus this year was on the implementation of real solutions by cities, industries, utilities, and financiers. And there was a delegation from Florida, Texas, and Louisiana. Tampa Bay was well represented by myself and Doyle and John Bennett, the chief of staff for Mary Jane Castor over in Tampa, and they're looking forward to coming here and presenting to you as well next year, Commissioner Gerard. So um, I'm very, very enthused about what we're doing and how that subject matter is really becoming so important for us here, and I hope that you'll all stay tuned to learn more about how we can take advantage of some of the things that we've learned. Uh, Barry, Raheem, Kelly, and Hank are also hearing about it as we move forward, and I think it'll prove to position Pinellas County and Tampa Bay as international leaders in this year as we move forward. We've made contacts at the United Nations and in Washington, D.C. on the committee that's been established in the Congress on climate change and sea level rise. And so I look forward to sharing all of that information with you next year. Happy New Year and Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you, Jake, for all of your work and congratulations on your second retirement. Thank you for all you've done for us. I would like to extend sympathies to the family of former Mayor Di Nicola from Indian Rocks Beach, who passed away last week. His funeral was on Monday. And um, I'd like us all to wish a happy birthday to our supervisor of elections, because today's her birthday. Happy birthday, mm -hmm. Deborah. Happy birthday, Deborah. <laughs> sure Thank you, more. Madam Chair. I have one more thing. OK. Well, since this is our last meeting of the year, we wanted to say thank you for being our chair this year. Thank you for your uh, encyclopedic <laughs> memory of details and events and where to find things. And um, it's been a good year. And thank you for setting the stage for another good year next year. And we have a gift that we picked out specially for you. <laughs> <laughs> While she's doing that, I'm passing down to all of you an article oh. that was in today's paper Don't about we economic development. You, well. <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? <clears throat> I'll, I'll give you that. She likes it. Yes, she does. See. So, the gator over yeah. this. Yeah, see the it. gator. We can't the see gator. it. Over orange trees and everything. Oh. Over the nice. <laughs> <laughs> That's Thank hilarious. You. Like You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Have that. <laughs> well, Commissioner Seal, did you do your letter on the economic development piece? Yes, it um, is very strong. 
Can we oh. see a copy of it, please? She um, we just approved it earlier today, so when it goes out, I'm sure you will be copied on it. Great, because I passed out to you the article that was in the Times today on technology, and it so capsulizes in that yeah, brief I article that. how important this issue is to us in Tampa Bay. Okay. So stay tuned. Sure. Um, I do have a few final comments, um, but before that, Jeanette, do you want to tell us what the... Sure. Oh, yeah. Um, and thank you for your patience. There was quite a few there. So um, item 53 was the appointment to the Housing Finance Authority Board, and the tally comes in with uh, six votes for Mary Kim Wagner and one for David Rodowsi. Um <coughs> And then I believe you guys were able to handle the voting on item 54 without me. Right. That was a single. Item 55 was regarding the value adjustment board and approving one appointment. The tally came in with six for Frank Mokowski and one for Daniel Flannery. And then item uh, 56 is regarding the Historic Preservation Board. Um, and that one was for one appointment. Uh, the tally was six for Estelle Lowenstein and one for Jeffrey Brown. And then item 57 is for the Lehman Community Redevelopment Area Advisory Committee. And the appointment, uh, I believe, is for five. Um, I have uh, Brian Ellis with seven votes, Gary Grooms with seven votes. Forgive me for pronouncing things incorrectly. Viet Nguyen, seven uh, votes. Teresa Van Alstein, six votes. Eric Ventura, three votes. And Tammy Williams Hussein five votes. So if you're looking for five altogether, uh, the only one that would not be there is Eric Ventura. Okay. Very good. Um, I think that takes care of all of the appointments and reappointments. And so um, I just wanted to mention, um, <clears throat> I went to, I wanted to give my s sympathies to the, uh, to Rennie D. Nicola, um, so Mayor Bob D. Nicola passed away, and he was um, such a wonderful beach mayor from Indian Rocks Beach who worked um, very cooperatively. He helped to start the Big C um, Coalition and um, our sympathies to his family. Um, the, um, Janet mentioned the Tibarda meeting that we had at Tampa International, but we also had a Tibarda meeting last week. And probably the only thing, um, and I'd like to see if we could schedule this maybe even for forward Pinellas, but um, there is a gentleman who developed an app, and it's called Pick My Kid. Oh, yeah. And it, he was waiting, and he picked up the wrong kid from carpool. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and so he, he he was like, I. he had just sold a business, and he says, I am going to do something about this. And so he has created this really comprehensive <laughs> application <laughs> to coordinate up. picking up at schools, you know, dropping off and picking up. But well, what so, made that so special was that he was Indian, and the child that he picked up was a little white kid. <laughs> so was, Did he? Do you remember it? that? It was it, hilarious. Well, I, okay. <laughs> so he was um, so you know, He has he has some private schools in Pinellas County, yeah. but there are no public oh, schools that are using the app. And I just think that you know we need to figure out how to push this because I think it's a very valuable service and it saves. You know, I mean, not came only came through the our the tech garage, right, or the innovation center. Didn't he come through that? I've heard. I, I, I thought I saw he? a presentation at their one of their meetings. Okay. I have heard that before. All right. Yeah. Well, that Unless makes I'm it even more important. mixing it up with a very important. similar app. And then um, we're looking at moving meetings to maybe bi-monthly instead of monthly. So, um, and that uh, since we vary our locations, we want to make sure that each location has. Um, 
certain technological capabilities, including live streaming and conference phone access. So that is that. Again, um, thank you, Jake. And um, thank you, Charlie, for Pierre Pinellas. Uh, you started it off, you know, with one presentation last year, and I mean, he, I, we were talking about it earlier, and he's going to keep track of it because I don't. I just really, I hope that they're replaying it on our television station because I just think it really. We learned a lot about history this year. We learned a lot about cultural assets. Um, we had some great musical presentations and. Um, I'm glad you're going to continue it next year. And I so, think if you're hard up for something, you can just ask Jake to come back and tell the story. <laughs> you know, he knows everything that's happened in the yeah. last 50 years. So finally, um, also happy holidays to everyone. But I also want to thank you for a good year. Um, you know, when you have a new county administrator, you don't know how things are going to go. <laughs> and I think you hit the ground running. I think we've had a smooth year. Um, and but I we were asked to submit an article to a local magazine and so in kind of summary you know I told a little bit about the history about Pinellas County and how we went to single member and at large and then I told them a little bit about generally what we do because I was actually at a holiday event the other night from somebody in East Lake Woodlands and they had no idea what the county commission did when I finished telling them, they were like, oh, my gosh. Um, so, um, but in the end of it, I just basically said this commission works together because we respect each other, we work through solutions, and we find ways to serve you, the public. So You said all that you all in 150 the congeniality. words? Huh? You said all that in 150 did. words? Did. I did. <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> oh, it was succinct and to the point, so. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all very much, and we're adjourned until 6 o'clock. Thank you.